One big revelation of the last lecture, a point that I think was proven pretty conclusively, is that if we can find a way of rearranging our data to put the important stuff in one obvious place and the less important stuff in another, then lossy compression becomes way easier. Our goal at this point in the course with lossy compression is to delete certain parts of our input data, just hoping that the data we choose to delete isn't missed that much by whoever ends up looking at the, at the content that we're compressing. And we saw last time that we do have the option of removing data selectively. So if I have an image that's been encoded in the RGB color system, I could take advantage of the fact that humans don't see red and blue as much as they see green. They can distinguish levels of detail in green a lot more than red and blue. And so I could reduce the resolution of the red and blue planes. And we notice that if we do that versus reducing resolution of green, we observe a higher quality outcome. So even if I remove a lot of information from red and blue, I actually end up seeing an image of higher quality than if I remove even a relatively small amount of information from green. The problem is that there is some other information encapsulated in the red and blue planes, things like luminance or brightness, that I am losing. So I'm not just losing information about red and blue, I'm also losing some information about brightness. Some of the resolution of the brightness is lost if I reduce resolution of the red and blue planes in RGB. On the other hand, if I perform a coordinate change, so if I move my image into a different color system, where this Y channel does a lot of the heavy lifting as far as luminance and the greens are concerned. So the Y channel uh, formally is a luminance channel, but it also t uh, happens to contain a lot of information about the color green in the image. Um, some of the green information is stored in these two other color planes, but not as much um, as red and blue. So then what I can do is I can begin deleting information from the two CB and CR planes. And we saw last time this amazing difference. I can delete tons of information from CB and CR save way more space um, without that much of a noticeable drop in quality. And this is a, I guess, a pretty conclusive demonstration of the benefits of the right transformation. Lossy compression, unless we do one of these transformations, is sort of like looking for needles in a haystack. I've got all this data. I know some of it isn't very important. I have to go looking for the less important data and somehow delete it in a way that allows me to achieve an improvement in compression performance. That isn't really that easy. I almost think about that needle in a haystack approach sort of like finding back references in LZSS. It's some that I can do but requires quite a bit of time and I'm, it's very hard to guarantee any form of success. On the other hand, the idea of performing a transformation that just happens to rearrange my data. So remember that the transformation from RGB to YCBCR is actually invertible. Um, at least in a formal sense, if we think about pixels as having real valued um, uh, color values, then this transformation from RGB to YCBCR is absolutely lossless. It's lossless and invertible. It just happens that by doing the transformation, we are re rearranging our data in a way that makes the operations we want to perform, so selective deletion, more convenient. And that reminds me in a lot of ways of the pipeline that BZIP uses. And this general philosophy that we saw earlier in the course of instead of bringing our scheme to the data, um, why don't we bring our data to the scheme? And I think that was the beauty behind what BZIP does. Um, we use the BWT and the move to front transform um, to produce a resulting stream of output symbols that can be compressed really well by a relatively simple technique, a technique that doesn't require searching for needles in a haystack. And I think we should follow that logic now in lossy compression. So this lecture is about the core transformation used at the heart of the JPEG scheme and lots of other image, video, and audio compression schemes. It is something called the DCT, the Discrete Cosine Transform. And the DCT is a spectral method. It is a relative of the Fourier transform. And that means that I have to sort of grit my teeth a bit here and not just give a lecture about spectral methods in general. We don't have time for that. And I don't want to step on the toes of all the people that give lectures in those subjects uh, in other courses. So I'm going to be very careful and try and stay in my lane. I want to talk a bit about the intuition behind the DCT, but mostly I want to do a few experiments. I want to try out um, the various modifications I can make once I've performed a discrete cosine transform, maybe to build some kind of, um, I don't know, like intuitive understanding of why it is that the DCT is so helpful. Um, in the meantime, before we get to the DCT, I have a bunch of other pieces that I want to put together. 
The first thing I want to do is talk about transformations in general. I'm going to talk about transformations in the context of this numerical data set, which means I'm going to be basically performing lossy transformations on this set of weather data, which is a bit counterintuitive in some ways. So we'll notice, of course, that if I perform these lossy transformations, the data looks sort of bizarre. It doesn't, um, we expect data like this, numerical data in a table, to retain accuracy and precision. So if I make, if I manipulate it in some way, it looks sort of odd. Um, but I think I can still prove the point. I want to work with actual numbers and not pixel values to eliminate, I guess, the perceptual factor. I want to actually look at the result of performing transformations. So what I've done is I, or what I did back when I created uh, this set of slides first in 2020, is I went and gathered some weather data, so observations of temperatures throughout the day um, from Victoria for, uh, for various days of the year, for, the, for actually an entire year worth of data. And I averaged out the temperature of the morning in each day. So the morning is every um, temperature observation that came in before noon. So even 1 a.m. is in the morning. Um, and then I averaged out the afternoon for each day. This table here, uh, each row of this table is the pair of morning and afternoon observations for one day of the year. It doesn't make much of a difference which day it was. You can see I'm not actually showing the day. All of these are from early in 2020. And it's nice in July to look at these because over the last few days it has been really muggy and unpleasant. And it's nice to think back to times when days had a morning average temperature of like 5 degrees Celsius or afternoon temperature of 6.5 degrees Celsius. That is sort of nice. Um, so even though Victoria has got a very nice climate, I still am allowed to complain when it's way too hot outside. Uh, so obviously we would expect that the two values in each row display some correlation. If it's warm in the morning, it's more likely to be warm in the afternoon. Um, and obviously uh, if it is an average of about 7.8 degrees in the morning, then you know at 12.01, so one minute afternoon, it's probably still close to 7 or 8 degrees or something. So it makes sense that the average afternoon temperature is definitely going to be correlated to the average morning temperature. Not always, uh, because you know there could be days where it just suddenly starts snowing or pouring rain at 11.55 a.m., but in general, that's a correlation we can expect to exist. Uh, and here is a plot of uh, the observations for an entire year, from May 2019 to April 2020. I didn't go and update this data for 2023, but I'll bet that it looks pretty similar. Maybe it's a little bit warmer, unfortunately, but um, it looks, I'll bet it looks pretty similar. So I've plotted the morning average temperature for each day um, on the x-axis and the afternoon temperature uh, on the y-axis. So one particular data point here would be the observation for one day. It's morning and afternoon temperature. And of course, we stare at this, and I mean, I'll just eyeball it, but it looks a quite a bit like there's a correlation there. It looks like if I were to draw a line of best fit, it would look something like that. And what do you know? I can draw a line of best fit, and it does look something like that. So I won't belabor this point, but if I use L2 regression, so least squares regression, uh, I can derive this relationship here. I get the line of best fit y equals 1.15x. Now, if you want to know whether L2 regression or L1 regression or some other type of regression is the best choice for this data set, then this is the wrong course for that. Although I have a video I posted in some other course talking all about different forms of regression and why we might want to use them. I'm going to use L2 regression just to keep things simple. So suppose now that I want to store just literally this table of values. So um, I, want to, I want to perform transformations that might act on this entire large set of 365 values. But for the sake of having a point of comparison, let's suppose I want to store just this table. So the question now becomes, before I even compress it, and remember that if we perform some lossy transformation, we'll probably feed the result into a lossless compression pipeline when we're done. I'm going to put that aside. Before I talk about lossy stuff, I want to talk about how would I store this data to begin with. Well, I could try and store these things as floats or doubles, but that might waste space because floats and doubles um, allow me a great deal more freedom than I need here. What I apparently need just to store this table, so not the other observations, literally just these observations here, apparently what I need are, hmm, I guess I need four significant digits and I need two significant digits or two digits after the decimal point. Okay, so what I could do is I could actually pretend that the decimal point wasn't there and view all of these things as unsigned integers. Um, and I notice that the maximum unsigned integer that I need under that interpretation is this one, 1310. So I suppose what I could do is I could just represent all of these in 11 bits. If I use it, the number of possibilities is 2 to the 11, which corresponds to the range um, 0 through 2047 
which is sufficient. So obviously that wouldn't be sufficient for arbitrary temperature values. I just want to prove a point about this one table over the next few slides. For arbitrary temperature values, they could be negative. They could be larger. Unfortunately, like a day like today or yesterday, it might be above 20 degrees. Um, so of course, 11 bits isn't enough, but I have to choose some point of reference. So I'm going to choose 11 bits with the idea that I just represent, uh, I use an unsigned integer representation with this implicit understanding that after two decimal digits, I have a decimal point. That, that's basically the, the logic I'm using. Uh, notice that 10 bits wouldn't be sufficient because if I use 10 bits, my range would be zero through 1023 or a temperature of um, 10.23 degrees, which is lower than my maximum. Okay, so I could use 11 bits per table entry to represent the entries of this particular table. If the table had a larger range, I would use some other number of bits. It doesn't make any difference for, given the point I'm trying to prove, but we'll use 11 as our reference point. Now, I know already that correlations can frustrate a lot of compression techniques. And we know this going back way into the lossless stuff. So, so we know, for example, that if we want those nice uh, assurances about the smallest amount of infra uh, the smallest amount of uh, number of bits we can use for entropy coding, for example, we would prefer it that each of our things be independent from the previous thing. And that's obviously not happening here. There are other reasons why the correlation can be troublesome. So one of them is the fact that um, even though I, I, I'm talking, of course, about these two pieces of data that are correlated and they're both absolute temperature values, values, so 5 and 6.9, or 4 and 6.5, or 9.35 and 13.10. And that gives us the impression that what I actually have here is um, a full range of values possible in both morning and afternoon. That is, morning can be any value between 0 and 20 degrees or whatever, and so can afternoon. But if I go and look at the values, the correlation, it's pretty obvious that that correlation makes that, that claim sort of false. Um, that is, if the morning temperature is, um, let's say, 10 degrees, the afternoon temperature is apparently not going to be negative 5. It could be, I guess, in, in a theoretical sense, that is possible, but it's very unlikely. And we know already that when we design compression techniques, we design them for the likely case. So what I would like is a representation that sort of represents this clustering in some way. The true range of values is quite a bit different than what the representation I was using implies. So for example, one way I could decorrelate the data would be to do a coordinate change. Um, I could represent each data point not as distance along x-axis, distance along y-axis, um, because you can see already that there's a lot of empty space that that representation sort of Im implies I might be using. Instead, I could represent each data point by distance along this red line and then distance orthogonal to this red line. So I could basically do a basis change um, into a basis that is this line and some line perpendicular to it. And what's nice about that is notice that the distance along the red line could be a large number. I, I have to go quite a ways up this line to get to some of my observations. But in general, most of my observations are very close to the line. They're within a pretty um, easily definable bracket in, uh, around that line. So if I do a coordinate change, I'll end up with two coordinates, distance along the line, distance away from the line. And that second coordinate will probably have a relatively small magnitude uh, compared to my current two coordinates, x and y where x could be any value between, I guess, about, what, negative 5 and 27 or something, and y can be any value between negative 5 and somewhere also around 25 or, or 27. So I want to decorrelate the data, perform some change of coordinates that tries to remove that correlation. Um, now, this is a good occasion, of course, to introduce errors. If I am performing lossy compression, this transformation hopefully will have the same effect as the YCBCR transformation did. It'll put the information that's easiest to delete, that has the least effect on the perceived accuracy of the data, it'll put that somewhere obvious, somewhere where it's easy for me to get rid of it as opposed to having to go find needles in a haystack. So one idea, that, something I spoiled a couple of slides ago is, because I noticed that my data is clustered around this line of best fit, and of course it's actually clustered around lots of different lines of best fit, depending on how you define a line of best fit, but we'll go with this one. Because it's clustered around this, why don't I transform the data set, basically doing a coordinate change, so that my two coordinates are distance along the line and distance away from the line. And one way of visualizing this is, I'm going to take the entire set and I'm going to rotate it down so that, and, and rotate this end up, so that the red line becomes the x-axis. I just rotate everything around so that the red line becomes the x-axis. And that means that distance away from the line becomes the y-axis. 
All right, so this is the rotation. This is after I've done, I'm finished the rotation. Notice that in this new plot, um, I'm gonna call the coordinates. I have to label my axes because it's important to always do that. But because I performed this sort of arbitrary transformation, I'm gonna call these coordinates transformed X and transformed Y. I'm not gonna try and give them some kind of a, a meaningful name because in a sense they aren't meaningful. They're the results of performing a rotation of convenience. Um, and the rotation specifically is, well, okay, if I have Y equals 1.15X, um, I can determine the rotation amount, if I want to think of this as a rotation, by just taking arctan of 1.15, it's about 0.85, more or less 0.85 radians that I'm, that I'm rotating it by. Um, okay, so uh, what I end up with here is this, which is the, the range of my transformed x coordinate is about negative 6 or so through about 33 or so. And that's actually a larger range than it was before. If I go look at my previous plot, the range of x values is negative 5 to something just under 20. Because if we're averaging out the entire afternoon temperature, that includes 11 o'clock at night. So although it does get to 30 degrees or 35 degrees in Victoria sometimes, it's not gonna be that way for 12 whole hours at a time, fortunately. Um, after my rotation, once I take this, once I uh, take this line and I rotate it downwards, the range of x values is actually larger in my transformed coordinate system. But the range of y values is much smaller, and it's more densely populated. So whereas here, the range of y values is this whole window here, but there are lots of areas that are just dead zones. There's nothing in them because of this correlation. In my rotated representation, uh, my y range is uh, somewhere around negative four up through about 4.8 or something. So a pretty tight range, maybe a range of about nine, as opposed to a range of apparently about 30 or so that I had before. And that's nice, because now that my Y range is smaller, I could choose to represent that transformed Y coordinate in fewer bits. Of course, doing so might sacrifice a little bit of accuracy, but hey, this is lossy compression. I'm allowed to do that. Uh, now, even better, Finally, in this lecture, I get to bring linear algebra into this course. It wouldn't be a course without some linear algebra. So I can formalize the transformation. And the reason I'm doing it this way is because later in this lecture, we're going to want to formalize the DCT in terms of matrices. I can formalize the transformation by taking all of my input points, so my original XY points, putting them in a matrix as the columns of the matrix. We'll call that matrix P. Uh, and then I formulate the rotation matrix that I'm using. So if I'm performing a rotation, I, I, I can write that down. It is a linear transformation. I can write it down as a matrix. There it is. Um, one great thing about doing this is as a rotation matrix, this is orthonormal, which means that the inverse, so M negative one, is actually just the transpose, which means I don't have to do any extra work to invert the transformation besides transposing the matrix and performing a multiplication. Then the set of transformed points is just M times P. And we'll call the transformed points P prime. As I mentioned a minute ago, uh, it turns out that the transpose of M is the, uh, and the inverse are the same thing, which means if I want my original points back, it's sufficient just to write, um, to, to multiply M transpose by P prime. So that means I do about the same amount of work to perform this, trans this transformation in either direction, and it's a linear transformation. So although I'm, in, I'm doing trigonometry and rotations, um, once I have the transformation worked out, I have a transformation matrix, it is linear, I just have to do a bunch of arithmetic, and of course, Processors are pretty good at that, so I can expect that to be reasonably fast. Uh, okay, so after the rotation, the x value ranges from negative 7 to 30, so a larger range than before, and the y value ranges between negative 4 and 5, so a smaller range than before, which is nice because now I can tweak the way I represent my data. Um, now, that isn't the only way I could decorrelate. There are other options. Um, so another option would be, instead of saying distance along the line and distance away from the line, I could instead say, let's just plot the original x coordinate as is. So I'll plot the morning temperature as my, x, as my transformed x. For my, after, for my um, y axis, I will plot the difference between morning and afternoon. So I'll use a differential representation. This would also work. And you'd get, m to, to some extent, you'd get the same effect. I'm deliberately trying to use that linear transformation because I want to show off that although it's an odd choice, it does help us. It reduces the Y range uh, more. So the range, the Y range here is larger than it was in this representation. Um, and that, of course, just because the transformation is arbitrary doesn't mean it's any less valid. And because it's also nice to bring in linear transformations because we're going to need them later. So I'm going to stick with the rotated representation. There are lots of ways to transform our data, though, that would uh, eliminate or reduce the impact of that correlation. 
Okay, so here is the, uh, if we look at that table from earlier, the one where I could represent each element in 11 bits, if I look at the rotated, the rotated transformed coordinates, here are the x and y values uh, that I get for each row of my original table. Uh, so, notice that the magnitude of the second component, this rotated y component, is much smaller because we observed earlier that the range of y values, even across the entire year, is a lot smaller um, than it was originally. Because, and that, that shows that we've succeeded in removing that correlation. The y values are clustered around zero. Some of them are negative, some of them are positive, but we've removed that correlation. Um, and in exchange, maybe we could argue that more information has been packed into the first of the two coordinates which is fine, transformations can do that. Um, that's sort of what we want though. Now I've got two coordinates and I sort of know which one I might want to sacrifice the detail of. If I want to delete information, maybe I could go wipe it out of this column here. So here's an idea to save some space. Let's store the observations in this representation. So what I send the decompressor is going to be some manipulated version of this table. The decompressor can always reverse my transformation. Maybe I provide the rotation matrix. Maybe the decompressor already knows what the rotation matrix is, but we know the decompressor can reverse any transformation that's invertible that I perform, the same way that we can perform inverse BWTs. So I'm gonna send the data in this format, and maybe I'll manipulate the format um, for for example, by instead of sending it in um, a, a real valued representation fully where every value has a decimal expansion, I might, I don't know, um, send the x coordinate uh, in full precision but round the y coordinate to the nearest integer. So negative 0.6 becomes negative 1, 0.28 becomes 0, 0.69 becomes 1. So I will round this off to an integer which is nice because if I know that the y range, it, the, that the set of all y values falls into a range of size 8, I could then just store all of my y values in 3 bits. I'm still going to store the x value in 11 bits, keeping in mind that 11 bits is arbitrary here, but it's a good. we just need some point of comparison. But I'm now going to store the y value in 3 bits. So while the original data required 22 bits per row, this data is going to require 14. 11 for the x, 3 for the y. All right, so then I take that transform data that I've manipulated, so I've wiped out the decimal expansion of the Y column to eliminate some, to, to delete data so that I can save space. Um, if I then invert the transformation, I'll get this. I'm gonna call this reconstructed data. It isn't the original data, it's the result of applying the inverse transformation to my transformed and manipulated data. This is what the decompressor would get. It is the result of lossy transformations, and so it's not necessarily going to agree exactly with the data I started with. So I'm gonna call it reconstructed constructed. It's the best reconstruction we can come up with given the data the decompressor actually had. If I compare this to the original data, I can, I guess, all we know how to do right now is glance at it and decide if I like it. Okay, so I'll start at the first row. 7.8, 8.1. And I end up getting 8.1, 7.8. Yuck, okay, that's terrible. Okay, I guess my transformation failed. Uh, well, this is the problem with, with um, human perceptual bias. So uh, obviously uh, I've got primacy bias here. The first thing I see is the thing that's gonna color my impression of the entire table. And that first row looks terrible. It looks like I've gone from, I was maybe willing to sacrifice some decimal precision, but I've actually inverted the observation. The morning temperatures ended up in the afternoon and vice versa due to some odd coincidence. But let's look at all the other rows and see what we think of those. 5.6, 6.9 goes to 5.8, 6.7. So they're both off by, I don't know, about 0.2, okay? 4.0, 5.6, 3.79, 5.8. Those are also off by more or less 0.2. So 0.2, 0 0.25. Um, we've got 5.1, 8.2, uh, 4.8, 8.5, that's off by, I don't know, about 0.3. That's not so bad, that's not nearly, this first row is really a, a, a special case. The other rows are off by a, 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 a measurable but not terribly significant amount. An amount that we chafe at a bit if we're looking at tables of data, but remember that being off by, I don't know, 5%, 2%, 10% even, isn't necessarily the end of the world if you're looking at pixels of an image. It's about whether your eye buys the result. Um, and also keeping in mind that looking at a pixel of an image, you're looking at three values for three different colors, color planes. And so if a couple of them are off by 5%, maybe you won't notice. So I'm actually saying, if I see the rest of this table, I, I don't notice 
too much of a problem. Um, we'll look at a couple more. So 4.1, 8.1, 4.3, 8.0. Yeah, again, on average, they're off by maybe 0 0.2, 0 0.3. Um, 9.3, 13.10, 9.0, um, 13.4. So they're off by 0.3. It seems like on average, each row of the table is off by somewhere between 0.2 and, and 0.4, except for this one, which is sort of nasty. But in lossy compression, you have to, sometimes you have to sacrifice. If you're performing lossy compression, there will be times that you flatten out detail completely or you get uh, anomalies showing up. That's, that's sort of the cost of doing business. So I would argue that from a human point of view, um, it looks as if I've managed to introduce some errors into the data set. Okay, that's what I wanted to do. And the errors got diffused among the components. That's really the goal here. The amount of the error is a different issue because I can control how much error I introduce by controlling what manipulations I apply. What I care about is when my transformation is inverted, the errors that I introduce in one obvious place. So here I put the error in one really obvious quantifiable place. What I care about is the errors I introduce when the transformation is reversed, the errors get distributed relatively evenly among all of my data points. Um, in particular, they get distributed among both columns. And I think that is happening here. So if I want an error that's less than 0.2, I can change how I manipulate data. If I'm willing to abide an error that's more than 0.4, I can also change how I manipulate the data. What I care about is this transformation rearranges the data such that I can go and delete stuff. And then when the transformation is reversed, the errors are distributed among all of the components. That's nice. Uh, and I've managed to, to eliminate about a third of the data. So I, I, going from 22 bits per row down to 14, this is the reason why I had to come up with some number of bits to use. Going from 22 down to 14 uh, means that I, I'm using 63% as much space as I was before. So I've gotten rid of 33% of the data I had. I haven't even done any lossless compression techniques yet. So I've used a lossy technique that gets rid of one third of my data. I shouldn't be too surprised that I do lose some accuracy. Now, suppose that I delete the second component altogether, which means that I'm now storing the table in 11 bits per row. I'm just storing the x, this transformed x value only, and I'm getting rid of the y value completely. In this lecture, when I talk about discarding the second component, obviously, I, I think it's clear in this context, but it's clear in general, I intend this to be the case. When I say delete the y component, what I mean is don't send the y component to the decompressor. Just send the decompressor the x component, and the decompressor will assume that the y component is always 0. If I do that, um, um, and I take a look at my morning and afternoon temperatures, you'll notice that they do still look surprisingly convincing. I've deleted one half of my data after performing one transformation and without doing that much extra analysis. And I end up with a, a table that looks somewhat plausible. We'll, we'll compare it. Here's my original data with 22 bits. Here's my reconstructed data with half as much information. So I now get 7.8, 8.1. And for some reason, this transformation actually does better than the last one did. Um, I've got um, 4.0, 5.6, 4.5, 5.2. So they're both off by less than point, I, I, more or less 0.5 or 0.6. 4.27, 6.52, 5.07, 5.8. So they're off by about 0.7. So there is certainly noticeable error here. Um, and I should add that my ability to notice error really doesn't mean anything. If you or I look at this table and decide if we like the numbers, that isn't really a scientific way to approach this. And in a minute, I'm going to have to talk about some mathematical measurement of error. Although for images and audio and video, we can't measure compression performance entirely in terms of a mathematical measurement, we need something. We need some way of measuring error mathematically so that we know that we're not missing something obvious as human observers. Because human observers are affected by obvious psychological biases like primacy or recency or whatever. Um, what I'll observe here, before we know how to measure error, what I will observe is this table still looks relatively convincing. It is not capturing every detail of the original table, but it's capturing quite a bit of the detail. It's off by a bit, but the error seems to be distributed relatively evenly. Some rows benefit more than others. Um, but what I end up with does capture quite a bit of the original flavor of the data, even though I've thrown away lots of information. And I would also add, in a typical lossy transformation, if you're worried about accuracy like that, what you, you probably wouldn't chop off this much information right at, at the beginning beginning, you chop off less and then run it through a lossless technique in the hopes that you can achieve lossless compression that reduces the total complexity down to maybe 11 bits per row or less. 
Um, okay, so we, we could, of course, try uh, directly manipulating the original data. So, I mean, what's the point of a transformation? Why don't I just go through and begin wiping out bits of the original data? The issue is it's very hard to choose a scheme that um, basically uniformly modifies all of the data. So it applies, it, it introduces the same amount of error into all of the data that does then result in me achieving compression. That is, if I try and, you know, um, re reduce the precision of the data by trying to chip away by 0.2 or 0.5 at each element, is that necessarily going to result in something that's easier to compress? I mean, if I subtract 0.2 from this, do I get a number that's easier to compress? Probably not. Um, if I just chop off precision uniformly, so if I begin chopping off decimal places, it's going to mean something different to every value. If I chop off two decimal places from this number versus this number, it's going to have a different effect. Um, and so these transformations can be helpful because they can align our data in a way that we no longer have to go searching for a needle in a haystack. We just delete something obvious and the transformation does the job of spreading out the error we've just created among the data we started with. And I think that sets the stage for the rest of this lecture. Um, okay, so this is what I just said. Um, and I, I really think this is actually revisiting, this is sort of uh, uh, distilling down some of the benefits that we saw in the RGB to YCBCR transformation. Ultimately, that's what the, the transformation was doing for us. It was rearranging our three color planes in such a way that the stuff I need to keep is in one really obvious place, and the stuff that's less important, so the CB and CR planes contain mostly red and blue information, although they contribute in some way to the green plane, um, the less important stuff stuff is in another obvious place. If I scale these down, I'm eliminating, I guess you could say, only the information that is least important. And I'm keeping the most important information safe in the Y plane. Uh, and really, this is something we can generalize. What I want is to have the same ease of use that I had in this transformation. I didn't have to go looking for what pixel data to delete. Once I did the transformation, it was all just sitting right in front of me. It was served right up on a silver platter. We can do the same thing with other transformations, not just for color information, but for anything. If we can find a transformation that stratifies our input, that puts the important stuff in one obvious place and the less important stuff in another, then we can go through and manipulate that in a pretty heavy-handed way. We don't have to go searching for what to delete. It's right there. Um, and then we can delete it and or modify it, attenuate it in some way, and then reverse the transformation. And that is what uh, a scheme like JPEG does. It uses the DCT, the discrete cosine transform, uh, and then transform and then takes the transform data and manipulates it. And then the transform is reversed by the decompressor. The DCT is a transformation that applies to the details of the image. So whereas if I were to scale the image down, I create a pixelated effect, um, the DCT, if I modify that, doesn't create an effect that is obviously noticeable to most people if you are relatively cautious with what you delete. And even if you're relatively aggressive, the effect usually isn't that disturbing. So it's a transformation that, that is that tends to separate minor details from major details in an image. And that means that by modifying the transform representation, I can get rid of those minor details first and leave the major details such that a human observer may not be able to notice the difference. And if they do notice, they may not care. Now, before I talk about that, I've got a couple of other things I have to check off the list. One of them is measuring error. So, okay, when I went from 22 bits down to 11, there were errors. And I made a bunch of observations that were affected by my human bias, like, oh, this first row does better in the 11-bit version than the 14-bit version. Does that mean that the 11-bit version is globally better? It turns out the answer is going to be no. But um, whether I'm able to make that decision by visual inspection is certainly suspect. I, I really shouldn't be allowed to do that. We need some way of measuring errors. So can we mathematically quantify the amount of error? I need anything. I don't even mind if it's a bad measurement. I just need something that generally does correlate to the total amount of error. So we can use this. We can drag this um, uh, quantity out of, this comes out of signal processing. Maybe you can, that's, you've been tipped off by the word signal there. Um, and the fact that this is clearly coming out of some kind of um, empirically derived science because I'm seeing logs in base 10. And I don't know where I come from. We see logs in base 10. We, we wonder whether this was made, this was a uh, measurement that's been created as a result of uh, trying to measure errors in observational data or something, because I just like logs in base 2. Whatever, we could actually use logs in base 2 for this, but we're going to try and be magnanimous and fit in with the rest of the community here. Um, we're going to define what's called the peak signal-to-noise ratio. 
Now, before we get into the signal processing aspect of this, and don't worry, there's not much of that, um, I will define the mean squared error, which is a quantity we all should be familiar with. So I'm going to treat, so suppose I've got some input sequence, we'll call it S, and the idea here is S is some sequence, um, it's a discrete sequence, but I can also view this discrete sequence sort of like a function. And I'd like to, in most of this lecture, use this function style notation. So we can call this S of 0, we can call this S of 1, we can call this S of 2. Okay, so let S be some signal, which we can interpret as a discrete function that corresponds to an input sequence. Now, let T correspond to some kind of approximation of S, so some other signal, some other sequence that is intended to be either an approximation or a reconstruction of S. What I, the question I want to ask, so I can think of this as S and this as T, the question I want to, want to ask is, globally, how far away is T from S? What's the, what's the general measurement of error between a T and S? So I can compute the mean squared error by just going through each element, so for each element, oops, I forgot to put an upper bound on my summation. For each element, I could compute the difference and then square that. So that would be the, uh, the, the squared error for that element. I then average that over all elements to produce the mean squared error. Uh, there are lots of ways of measuring error. This is not the only one of them. So the mean squared error has certain benefits. Again, this actually goes back to, this, to choosing between L1 and L2 regression in some ways. There's some of the same um, logic in play. There's this, another lecture that I've posted about that for some other course. Let's not worry about that. We're going to use mean squared error. Um, another option would be things like using the absolute error, but again, not going to do it. So I take my mean squared error, and then the PSNR is equal to um, this quantity here. So 20 times log base 10 of the maximum value of s divided by the square root of the mean squared error. Uh, and uh, so that is a quantity that doesn't actually have any units. Um, it's a one-dimensional quantity, which is fine. It turns out that if we want to use it for a two-dimensional image, it's pretty easy. So whereas previously I might have had s of 0, um, s of 1, and then for each thing I take t of 0 and I, I just compute the error between s of 0 and t of 0 and the error between s of 1 and t of 1. If I wanted to do this for a two-dimensional case, so if I wanted to compute the PSNR of two images, then I could just as easily say, well, here are my two images. We'll do a two by two image. I've got S of 0, 0 and S of uh, 0, 1. Really, all I'm doing is generalizing this to a two-dimensional sum. The, the ultimate error is computed between pairs of elements that match up. So if I've got S and I've got T, this would be T of 0, 0. I just compute the difference between S of 0, 0 and T of 0, 0. So I could do all the same things. I can compute the PSNR for a two-dimensional array just as easily as I can with a one-dimensional one array. All I'm doing is pairing up elements. I just match up the corresponding elements of each of my two inputs. Um, if I want to compute PSNR for a color image, I've got a few different options. So one of them is I could look at each pixel. I could expand each pixel out to a linear sequence and then take the difference if we use RGB, for example, I could then look at the error between the R value of each pixel, the G value, and the B value as part of one big PSNR computation for the same image. The problem is that arguably I'm impacted a lot less by the error in the R channel than I would be in the, in the G channel, in the green channel. So it might be better in that case to just compute separate PSNR values for each color plane, regardless of whether you're using RGB or YCBCR, because each color plane has a different qualitative value value, I guess. And that means it's probably better not to try and mash them together for computing error. Additionally, there's the question of if we treat a pixel as one unified thing, so a, a, a point in the color space, do we want to compute the error by looking at the, uh, the difference between components? Or do we want to look at something like the distance between two vectors in space? So I could define the error between these two pixels. So there's P and there's P prime. I could compute the error between them either by just looking at the difference of their components, so breaking them up into their components and treating those like linear sequences, or I could compute, I don't know, the Euclidean distance between them which is the generalization of, of squared error, of, the, of usually a mean squared error, if we expand that to multiple dimensions, ends up turning into a norm. Uh, because I don't want to do that, we will adopt the convention that we'll just compute separate PSNR values for each color plane to avoid having to deal with those questions. 
Um, if I am trying to use PSNR to measure the quality of a transfer of a lossy compression scheme that that's used a transformation, it's generally a better idea for our purposes. Like if if you are evaluating your own scheme, if you want to compare the effects of two different uh, techniques that you're using, both inside of a transformed space like YCBCR, it probably is a better idea to compute the PSNR based on the on the YCBCR color planes, not on the RGB ones, um, because the the inverse transformation might do something to the error measurement that makes it hard to see what's going on. Now that said, if I'm evaluating an image compressor from the outside and I'm sending in RGB images, I'm going to have to compute PSNR based on RGB because I have no way of knowing what a compression tool is doing internally. I don't know whether it uses YCBCR. So keep that in mind. As a measurement for your own purposes, you might prefer to use um, to, to compute PSNR based on the transformed coordinates. Now, I mentioned a minute ago, PSNR is actually a, a synthetic quantity. It has no dimensions. It has no units. It's, it's basic. I, I, mean, I don't want to say it's made up, but it, it comes out of uh, a different discipline and we're using it because it is a measurement of error that can be used for things like signals. And there's a reason why we want to pivot towards thinking of this as a signal because what we're about to do with the discrete cosine transform also relates to treating things as signals. Um, traditionally, uh, traditionally, we consider PSNR to be measured in decibels. So I, I, don't like, I don't like this too much, but okay, we can try that. Um, there are reasons we, we, that that's our tradition. One of them is because people in signal processing are using decibels for other things, so it feels like home, and decibels are measured with a logarithmic scale. And PSNR is also logarithmic, so of course maybe it makes sense to use a logarithmic scale. Um, we should be careful. Um, we shouldn't use PSNR as the be-all and end-all of quality, but it is nice to use it as to get some um, sense of perspective about error. We can use it in a general sense to compare um, between two data sets where we're unclear about which one has more global error versus the original. We can use PSNR to help us break the tie or to give us some perspective and help us defeat our own biases. So one observation, though, is a high PSNR corresponds to low error. If you have a, a transform signal that's identical, the PSNR is actually infinite. It's not really infinite because infinity is not a number, but it's notionally infinite. Um, I've looked into this because PSNR is a synthetic measurement. There's no specific number that makes a, an approximation good quality or bad quality. Um, and depending on the discipline and what you're trying to accomplish, good quality and bad quality can mean different things. We're, we care about images and video, so I'll just talk about that. Um, it appears that if you have a PSNR in the range of 30 through 50, keeping in mind that 30 is lower quality than 50, if you achieve a PSNR between 30 and 50, you're getting high quality lossy compression. If it's above 50, then it's even higher quality. Maybe you can sacrifice some quality. Um, if it's generally above 30, though, that's a sign you are getting high quality, at least in the, in the general um, accepted view of the community. Um, it's also uh, the MPEG committee, so MPEG is a video compression standard, more on that in the next lecture, um, has decided that they consider a PSNR change of 0.5 to be perceivable. So if I perform a transformation that modifies, the, the, that changes the total PSNR by 0.2, it's unlikely that a human viewer would notice the difference. If it changes by 0.5 or more, a human viewer would notice a perceivable impact on quality, lower or higher. So that's also something we should keep in mind. All right, so in, we performed two different manipulations on our transform data. The first one was to round off the y-coordinate before we reverse the transform. That resulted in a representation that required 14 bits per row. I observed this really nasty thing happening in the first row, but otherwise that the remaining rows are generally only off by 0.2 or 0.3. The PSNR of the original data versus the reconstructed data is 35. So although maybe the data is no longer suitable for numerical data analysis purposes, this is considered high quality if we think about it by the standards of image or video compression. Um, the second transformed representation I tried was deleting the y-coordinate altogether. So now I'm, I'm storing my data in 11 bits per row. I'm just storing the transformed x-coordinate. And we notice that although this still looks... I don't know, plausible as data, it definitely is off by a bit more on average. Its PSNR is 22. So low PSNR is low quality. So 22 is significantly lower than 35. So my 14 bit per row representation was definitely higher quality, even if there were some individual anomalies that I didn't like. Okay, so that's how we can measure error. That's one way of measuring error in the absence of any better ideas. 
Now, before I get to the DCT, one more thing we have to talk about is waveforms, signals. Um, so consider this function. This is a function f of x. You might notice it looks, hey, it looks sort of like a wave, in fact, and that's because it is a linear combination of two cosine waves. It is a periodic function because I can, uh, there's a way I can chop it up. So if I take this segment of it here, it turns out that this segment repeats infinitely. It just keeps repeating in both directions off to infinity. So f is a periodic function. Not every periodic function is as, is as easy to identify as this one, but this is definitely a periodic function. Uh, it also looks, the slides are sort of stating the obvious, it looks a lot like a waveform, but really a continuous periodic function will eventually look like a waveform if you're open-minded enough and you zoom out far enough. Um, it shouldn't surprise us that it looks like a waveform because it's the sum of two cosine waves. We happen to know that about it already. Uh, speaking of which, let's talk about linear combinations of cosine waves. So F is a linear combination of the two cosine waves G and H. F is not the sum of G and H because as you you can see the coefficient on H in, in H is different than the coefficient in F. But maybe you can see I could uh, uh, multiply H by something to get 3 instead of 1 half there. I could multiply it by 6. So F is a linear combination of these two cosine waves. Uh, so I can separate F out into its constituent waves. Um, the amplitude of those waves, that is to say the up and down, the up, the up down direction, um, so the, the height of the wave, the amplitude, isn't that important because when I synthesize F out of its constituent waves, I can always multiply the constituent waves by whatever I want to increase or decrease their amplitude. Um, what's showing up inside of the argument to the cosine um, is a way of dictating the frequency of the wave or, or accordingly the period of the wave. Uh, and so in this case, F is a linear combination of these two waves. It turns out that any infinite periodic waveform is a sum of a finite number of sine or cosine waves. Um, you know already that really you could do everything in terms of sine or everything in terms of cosine because you can create a sine wave out of a cosine wave by shifting things around. Um, we are going to focus on cosine waves in the service of me staying in my lane and not just giving a general lecture on spectral methods. Um, so any infinite periodic waveform is the sum of a finite number of sine or cosine waves. Now, here is a non-continuous, non-infinite function. This is a discrete function. I'm going to call it Q. Um, and the way I've drawn it, it looks sort of odd. The way I've drawn it is Q is a discrete function. It's only defined on integer coordinates. So Q of 1, Q of 2, and so on. I guess we go up to Q of 10. Um, because plotting a discrete function doesn't look very interesting, really the, the function is only defined at these dots. Um, for the sake of providing some perspective, I've drawn these gray bars to give you a hint about the nearest value of Q. So if your X value is, I don't know, let's, let's do 1.75. Well, Q is not defined here at all. It's a discrete function, it's not defined. But for the sake of visual reference, the nearest point of Q is Q of two, which has the Y value 15. So I've drawn the gray bar to tell you just as a general point of reference what the, the closest value of Q is. But the gray bars mean otherwise nothing. They're just a visual aid. So Q is this collection of points. Now, here is what I ultimately want. What I have is a one-dimensional function, but I could have a two-dimensional function like an image, like the pixels of an image. Really, if I think of a 1D array of data, I could think of it as a one-dimensional discrete function, just like Q. What I want is a transformation, ideally one that preserves the size. So Q currently has 10 values. There are 10 X coordinates and 10 Y coordinates. I could store Q as an array of all the Y coordinates. So the first Y coordinate is, I don't know, six, then I've got 50. 15, uh, then I've got, I'm going to eyeball that and say that's 18, uh, then I've got 15 again. I could store Q as a vector of 10 Y coordinates. So, you, you know, X, X equals 1, Y equals 6, X equals 2, Y equals 15. What I want is some transformed representation of Q that makes lossy compression easier. If I store Q just as a vector of Y coordinates, how do I delete the data such that the error is propagated uniformly among my array? That's difficult. I want a transformation that helps me do that. Okay, so here's my problem. 
Um, I'm actually going to try and uh, uh, perform that transformation by defining a continuous function that interpolates Q. In other words, what I want is, I've got a discrete function, what I want is a sort of continuous, a nice continuous function that uh, matches up to Q at every point where Q is defined. But to be clear, I don't care that the continuous function behaves nicely between points. As long as at each of the points where Q is defined, the function that the curve I come up with matches Q, I don't care what it does in the meantime. This is an interpolation problem. And those of you that know me from some previous course or something know that I am fascinated by interpolation. I am now wondering as I say this whether I can just teach a course in just interpolation, but I don't think I can. I don't think it's that. There's, there may not be that much to teach at, a, at, at this level or that people want to hear. Um, I'm really interested by interpolation and I think that presenting this, this transformation we're about to do as an interpolation problem makes it a lot easier to conceptualize. So we are not trying to interpolate an image. That is actually not our goal. Interpolating an image would be, find, for example, Example, something you might do if you're trying to find a clever way of scaling the image down by strange multiples or strange divisors. Um, but what I'm really trying to do is I'm trying to define a function that um, I'm trying to define uh, the value of Q or extend the value of Q into a different domain. So I am actually creating an interpolating function. So one idea would be that for any, any set of n points, so if you give me n x, y pairs, I am able to always construct a polynomial with degree n minus 1. So the polynomial would look like something times x to the 0 plus uh, something else times x to the 1 plus dot, 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 um, plus something, so the n minus 1th coefficient, n minus 1st coefficient uh, times x to the n minus 1. So a polynomial, we'll call it p of x of degree n minus 1. So that's the highest exponent. There will always be a polynomial of degree n minus 1 that exactly matches my um, original set of discrete points under the reasonable assumption that all of my x values are distinct. So because I want a function and because q is a function, I wouldn't be allowed to have two points with the same x coordinate because what's the value of q on x equals 3 if that's the case? So under that very reasonable assumption, um, I can always construct a continuous polynomial of degree n minus 1 that matches up with my discrete function at all of the points where it's defined as long as there are a finite number of such points. So for example, 10 of them. The reason why this is interesting is now I have an alternative way of representing my discrete function. Um, it's true actually also, this is just me talking because I love interpolation. It's true that this interpolating polynomial is actually defined for all um, real numbers. It goes off to infinity, although whether it's valuable outside of the defined domain of Q is, is, is dubious. It depends on what you're using it for. So that means that for this sequence of 10 values, the interpolating polynomial would look like this. And all we need to know to get the interpolating polynomial are the values of these coefficients c. Now, it's, we don't care for the sake of this course, but I will observe. You may know this from numerical analysis. Um, once you know your 10 input points, you can get these coefficients um, via linear algebra. You, you can solve a system of equations to find the coefficients. I've posted a separate lecture for, in my linear programming course about that. It's lots of fun. Um, so that means that now I've got two alternative uh, ways of storing the value of my function q in 10 values. I could store it as an array of 10 y values, or I could store it as this array of 10 coefficients. Um, because if you want to recover the values of q, you compute the polynomial, you use the coefficients to figure out the polynomial, and then you just evaluate the polynomial on x equals 1, x equals 2, x equals 3, and so on. So that's why I like this approach, thinking of this as interpolating. If I th come up with a clever function that matches my set of points, maybe the function is represented in a way that allows me to eliminate data easily. By transforming my discrete array of y values into a set of coefficients, perhaps now if I want to delete data, I could start by just, I don't know, wiping out a few of the coefficients. If I get rid of some of the coefficients, maybe I'm left with a curve that sort of approximates my function when I'm done. That's what I want with lossy compression. Unfortunately, with polynomial interpolation, that's not going to work. So if I delete the last five coefficients out of the 10, so in other words, my polynomial becomes 
it goes from x to the 0 plus some stuff up to uh, c4 times x to the 4. If I just ignore all of the other coefficients, if I set them all to 0, if I delete them, then I end up with this polynomial, which is useless. So this polynomial does still uh, get me close to one of the points of q, but it leaves everything else, everything else out in the cold. So that's not going to work. But I think this is an idea worth pursuing. Now, what we're doing when we compute an interpolating polynomial is trying to basically write f, because if you think about what a polynomial is, it's a linear combination once we've evaluated all of our, um, it's a linear combination of these functions. So although these are not linear functions, I am taking the functions and combining them with a linear combination. So the coefficients are, of course, um, constants once I've derived the coefficients. So what I've done is I've written out my discrete function q as a linear combination of polynomials x0, x1, x, uh, x to the 1, x squared, x cubed. The issue is this function doesn't have that much in common with most polynomials. So although you can make a polynomial that goes up and down as many times as you want, as long as it's a finite number of times, this function has some behavior that requires a lot of um, polynomials to properly interpolate. I need, I need 10 of them, x to the 0 up through x to the 9. Because the functions I'm combining are things like, okay, x to the 0 is a constant, x to the 1 is, um, well, I mean, it's some variant of a straight line. I don't know if it's pointing exactly diagonally upwards, but it's some kind of straight line with some slope. x squared is a parabola, x cubed is that. Um, and you look at all of those, and because all of them have to go up to infinity, either you know, positive infinity or negative infinity, it makes some sense that I really have to twist polynomials around to make them fit the, the motion of this function q. This function q is going up and down more like, hmm, like a waveform than a polynomial would. Polynomials can go up and down, but they're not as good at that. That's not really in their wheelhouse. Whereas going up and down gently is the kind of thing that a cosine wave or a sine wave is good at. Okay, that's an interesting observation. So it's obviously natural to think about this polynomial I've come up with as one entity, one curve. But actually, really, it's a linear combination of a bunch of functions. It's a linear combination, in this case, of these polynomials. So the, the basic polynomials x to the 0, x to the 1, up to the x to the n minus 1. It turns out, though, if you want to interpolate a function, if you want to derive a, a continuous function that matches up with a discrete one at a finite number of points, you are allowed to use as your basis, as the things you are combining, any collection of linearly independent functions. You're not limited to polynomials. I could use any collection of linearly independent functions I want. So if you give me a collection of n linearly independent functions, I could create an interpolating function that is a linear combination of these. So maybe, and, and this is a basis, so this set of things h is a basis. Don't worry, we're not going to need that word after the next few slides. Um, so that means if I choose maybe a better basis, I'll end up with an interpolating function that is easier to manipulate. And this is where I make the observation that it does look as if my discrete points that I started with go up and down a bit more often than polynomials may like to. These look a little bit more like a waveform than a polynomial. So here's an idea. Let's represent this discrete function using a linear combination of cosine functions. In effect, representing my linear function, my discrete function as a sum of waves. Okay, we'll try doing this. The reason why this might seem like a, a lead is that this function does seem to, uh, it, it stays within a pretty tight range. It doesn't seem to be going off to infinity in either direction. And it does have that oscillating behavior that seems to be a bit more natural to waves than to polynomials or to whatever else I might try and use. All right, so if I try to approximate it with one cosine function, I guess I'll start with an easy one. I'll use a cosine function with frequency zero, which is a, which is a horizontal line. If I do that, the best horizontal, the, the, way, the best fit that I can come up with in this case is to fit the line basically vertically between all of the points at the vertical average of, or at the average of all the y coordinates. Okay, that's not a great approximation. Uh, it turns out I can create a set of 10 linearly independent cosine functions. So if I use, if I uh, am allowed to use 10 functions, I should get an exact, um, a, a, an exact interpolation, an exact match. But let's see what happens if I use one. Okay, I get this. If I use two, I end up getting this. I introduce this one low frequency wave that gets a little bit closer than a horizontal line, but it's still not great. Okay, now I'm going to use three. 
For all the remaining diagrams, the green line is the sum of all the functions I've created so far. The red line is the, is the function I've just added in. So this is the third function I've added. I take my wave from the previous step and I add in this red line here and I get the green line. So notice how the green line is getting a little bit closer to uh, matching up with all of the points. I add four functions, it gets closer, I add five. As I go forward, the functions I add have higher frequencies. They are higher frequency waves. And one theme we'll notice forming is the high frequency waves help to establish finer details. Okay, I add six. Notice the green line is getting closer and closer. Uh, and actually, with only six, I'm already pretty close. I'm definitely off all of the points, but I'm now approximating the points pretty well. Um, when I only had five polynomial interpolating functions combined, I had this polynomial that was way off. With five cosine functions, the green wave is still close to many of my points. Okay, we'll keep going until we get to 10. After I fold in 10 functions, the green line will match exactly with all of the discrete functions points because of the rules of interpolating functions. Okay, so I have that. So now I can represent my original discrete function Q either as an array of these 10 Y values or as an array of coefficients on 10 different cosine waves. So 10 agreed upon in advance linearly independent cosine waves. And this is great because now I can try and manipulate those coefficients uh, as a way of um, performing lossy transformations, lossy compression. So I can uh, represent the function Q as an array of 10 values. The idea here, the reason I'm saying, I keep saying it's an array of 10 values is the X coordinates count up from one. So it's assumed we sort of know the X coordinates in advance. All we need to know are the Y coordinates for the particular value of Q. And that fits with our usual model of the world where Q, if Q is an array of values, we would number them either starting at zero or starting at one. So in a sense, these indices are like the X coordinates that, that we're looking at on the plot. Um, okay, so I've got that. I'm going to skip over this. I've already said this. Um, so I can recover my original values of Q either from the array of function values, the actual array of Y values, or from this array of 10 coefficients by computing that interpolating function involving all the cosine functions. Now, the observation I want to make for later that I've already pointed out is even if I only use five functions instead of 10, even if I delete half of those coefficients, the green line is still pretty close to most of my values. It is way off in a couple of cases, but it's not nearly as bad as the polynomial version was. If I only have five terms in my polynomial approximation, the function that I end up with gives me basically nothing to work with. One other observation to make is that if I look at the green line, the green line is a sum of a bunch of infinite waveforms. So if I zoom out, there's my discrete function there. It's, it's defined in a finite um, domain. Um, my green line is a periodic function that stretches off to infinity. Not that I care that much about that, but just another observation to make. It's periodic. Here is the part that I can copy and paste. So if I look at this segment here, this gets repeated over and over again uh, for all eternity in both directions. All right, so now the question is, how can I derive that set of coefficients? So I can represent my, any discrete function by a linear combination of cosine waves. Now, from first principles, the way I could come up with this is come up with linear, uh, a linearly independent set of cosine waves, then do a bunch of linear algebra uh, to compute the coefficients. That's one way. I could derive my very own transformation for this purpose. But instead of doing that, we are going to use a well-defined existing one called the discrete cosine transform. So let's consider some, discre some discrete function called g. And it's defined for, we'll, we'll use uh, as its uh, input the, a variable u, it's defined over indices 0, 1, 2, up to n minus 1. So we can actually think of g as literally an array of values. It can be a, an array of image values, pixel values. It can be an array of anything else that you want. It could be an array of audio samples. Um, but the idea is basically g is an array with indices 0, 1, 2, up to n minus 1. I want to think of it like a function, but really you can think of it as an array, and the inputs of the function are just indices into the array. Now do some definitions. And this set of formulas is going to look nasty. I mean, it already looks sort of nasty, but remember that's why we have computers. All we have to do is program this formula in if we want to use it. So although it's nasty, it's just a matter of typing a bunch of stuff in. So here's this coefficient CM I'm going to define for later. Then I'm going to, so I've got my original array G, lowercase g. What I want is an array of coefficients like I had earlier. So this example from earlier, the whole point of this was the green line is the result of a linear combination of cosine functions. And linear combination is dictated by the coefficients. What I want is a set of coefficients. 
So I'm going to derive this new array. My original array was G with my input data. I'm going to make up a new array called uppercase G that also has indices 0, 1, 2, up to n minus 1. But I'm going to treat G, uh, uppercase G, just like a function. So if I want the first coefficient, I evaluate G of 0, basically. Okay, so uh, what are the coefficients? How do I define them? Uh, well, it's defined, I'm going to write the word DCT of G, G. So DCT of G can be interpreted either as a sequence or as a function that you can evaluate to get the coefficients. And each value of G, so if I want the value of uh, the, the index 1 in my coefficient array G, I would evaluate uppercase G of 1. And it's this disgusting looking formula. That is called, um, and the resulting vector G is called the discrete cosine transform of G, of lowercase g. I will show some concrete examples in a minute. Don't worry, it's not as scary as it looks. Uh, okay, uh, now I, I will as a... Um, just a matter of keeping things separated. Although it's true that both lowercase g and uppercase g can be interpreted as arrays of length n, I'm going to use the uh, I'm going to use the variable m as the input to uppercase g and the variable u as the input to lowercase g because they are formally in different coordinate spaces. Um, the inverse DCT, if you have the array of coefficients and you want your original array back, so I want to know, so again, my original array is this array G, which has elements G of 0, G of 1, uh, G of 2, and so on. Uh, if I want those original values back, I have to perform the inverse DCT. Uh, and so the inverse DCT, I take my DCT coefficients, the values of uppercase G from earlier, and I run them through this also rather disgusting looking formula. Um, you occasionally see inverse DCT written as IDCT. Uh, the problem is there are also times in compression where you want to talk about integer DCTs. And to avoid confusion, I will therefore use this notation, functional style um, uh, inverse notation. So DCT to the negative one. So the DCT of a discrete function with n values is a, an n element array of coefficients. Now to be clear, they are real valued coefficients. Coefficients with a higher index correspond to the contribution of high frequency waves. Co coefficients with a lower index correspond to lower frequency waves. In general, the higher frequency components tend to contribute to finer details in the image or finer details in your input signal. And that means that attenuating them, so um, reducing their accuracy or deleting them altogether, tends to produce effects that are less noticeable to a human viewer or a human observer. And that means that if you want to save some space, you could um, re reduce the resolution or the accuracy or delete altogether some of those higher frequency coefficients. In other words, I am, I am introducing this idea that the DCT stratifies the information in your input sequence in a very convenient way as far as lossy compression is concerned. You can also compute a DCT with matrix uh, multiplication, and you will probably want to do this. It's not always appropriate, but if you for your assignments three and four, you will probably want to do this. I'll explain how in about 40 minutes. Um, so I could compute, if I want to compute the DCT, I could compute this matrix here. So if I have a sequence of n values, a one-dimensional sequence of n values, I would first make an n by n matrix. Um, it, we'll call it C. It's computed this way. So he, each entry of C is defined by these formulas. Uh, and I, I assume that um, although normally in linear algebra we index starting at 1, I will use zero-based indexing for the rows and columns of C because we all know we're going to program this. Um, then once I have the matrix C, if I want the DCT of a particular um, set of inputs, I will put the inputs into a column vector and then the DCT is just C times V. So the matrix C is orthonormal as I mentioned earlier that means that its inverse is its transpose which means if I want to invert the DCT I just multiply by C transpose. Now the last few slides were probably a lot. Um, I'll bet that once you see a numerical example you can relax a little bit. So here's an input array, my, my input sequence s, which I will write as a sequence, but we can also interpret this as a discrete valued function, s of 0, s of 1, s of 2. Uh, I compute the DCT using the formulas we saw a couple of slides ago. If you're worried that the formulas make no sense, you could try using them and see what you get and see whether you get this number too. Um, and so the DCT is this three element sequence. It has the same length as S. Um, if I apply the inverse DCT to this, so the, the set of computations to perform the inverse DCT, I will get S back identically. So the DCT itself is a fully invertible transformation. There's nothing, you, you don't lose any information by taking a DCT um, in another itself, although there might be some rounding issues, you don't lose any information. We, however, are going to begin manipulating the DCT to see what happens. And the way we're, I'm going to prove that point is just by trying a bunch of manipulations, and we can 
observe together the effects of each manipulation. I could also compute this DCT using the matrix. So I can compute my matrix C, um, and then uh, my DCT of my original sequence S, if I interpret S as a column vector, can be computed by multiplying C times S. And if we do that, we'll observe we get the same thing we got in the previous slide. So if you hate that complicated formula from a couple of slides ago, you can always compute the DCT using this matrix-based representation. The matrix-based representation isn't always a good idea, because remember that if I have a really long input sequence, I need this n by n matrix, which requires a lot of space. The formula is n squared, so evaluating this formula for every single coefficient is going to be n squared, but it doesn't take n squared space. So there are cases where the formula might be a better idea, although for image and video compression, you will probably always want to just use the matrix-based representation. Okay, so I can compute the DCT in two different ways. Um, you will probably want this one, which is probably more comfortable anyway, even, notwithstanding the fact that it's likely going to be computationally easier for you and your assignment. Now what I want to do is investigate what happens if I manipulate those transformed coordinates. What happens if I manipulate this before I do the inverse transformation? Okay, so let's consider um, this array here. I'm going to call it D. So our DCT of my sequence S, my original sequence is this in the next few examples. Um, this is the DCT. Now, the array D is the result of taking this DCT and rounding it to two decimal places. So I have lost some precision here. I've rounded this array off to be two decimal places. If I take the inverse DCT of this, I get my original sequence basically intact. I mean, there could be some, there could be some numbers lying down at the end of this decimal expansion, some small rounding errors. But in general, um, truncating the DCT to two decimal places doesn't really have an effect on the result. For lossy compression, this would definitely do the trick. So you can see how this rounding had no effect on the accuracy of the inverse. What this is showing us is a hint, it's anecdotal, but it's a hint that the DCT operation is numerically stable, that tiny um, perturbations on the DCT don't completely throw off the inverse operation, which is nice, that's good to hear. So let's see what happens if I eliminate more information. Suppose that I round the DCT to integer values completely. And this is a good idea because my original sequence was a bunch of integers. So if my transformed representation is real valued, it's going to take more space than my integer representation. So I round my DCT to integers. I take the inverse and I get this. Notice that if in the spirit of rounding, if I round each of these to an integer, I end up with my original sequence. So although this is different from my original sequence, it's within rounding distance from my original array. So I'm throwing away data from my DCT. DCT, and the data, the resulting inverse DCT, still is pretty close to my original input. Okay, let's try deleting stuff. Suppose I delete the last coefficient. So I'm completely removing one of the pieces of, inf of information and rounding the other two to integers. So I'm now storing, I could store this in two-thirds as much space as I was using for my original sequence, which was 6, 10, 17. So I'm now storing two values instead of three. The inverse DCT is this which if I rounded integers is 5, 11, um, 18. So it's off by a little bit. Um, in the case of numerical data, if I'm looking at my weather data, this would of course be a bit of a problem. In the case of image data, if the pixels value is six and it comes out as five, I don't know that I mind very much, especially given that I've saved one third of the total size. Um, so that's pretty good. Now suppose I do, I do the same, I remove the same amount of space, but I do it from somewhere else. In the previous example, I deleted the last coefficient. Let's try deleting the first coefficient. In this case, the result is way off. It, it, it has, um, there's a pattern you might observe later here, but clearly it's not. This is going to round to negative 5. That's going to go to, what, negative 1 and 6, which has nothing to do with 6, 10, and 17. Uh, that's not going to help me. There is some pattern in there, but it's not, it's not going to help me. It, it's not doing what I want. So this, right off the bat, has shown us that some coefficients of the DCT are more valuable than others. That first coefficient is apparently very important, whereas deleting the last coefficient didn't seem to have that big of an effect. And we'll notice that that generalizes. As our DCTs get longer, the later coefficients are things that, in general, if we delete them, don't have a huge effect on the input. There are cases where they can, but they're very specific pathological cases. So that's why the DCT is so nice. It's useful for lossy compression because from the point of view of our data, at least, the type of data we're compressing, the coefficients we get are essentially sorted into descending order. The early coefficients are important, so if I introduce errors there, I'm going to get myself into trouble. 
whereas the later coefficients are less important. So introducing errors there, so attenuating them or just deleting them, will result in less significant errors in my result. And this is great because it puts us exactly where we want to be. I don't want to go searching for which data to delete. I want it to be served up to me on a silver platter. So now I know what I want to do for lossy compression. I discard or at least reduce the accuracy of these later higher order DCT coefficients. Um, okay, so let's let's take another a look at uh, an example on a longer um, piece of data. Here's this array S. It's got five elements. Here is my DCT. If I round all of the values to integers and then I delete two of them, so I'm now storing 30% as many numerical values as I was to begin with, um, the inverse DCT gives me this. Now, this is real valued, so I should argue that if my original sequence was integer valued, I probably should round everything off to integers, so I round it off to this. Okay, so after my full transformation, so getting the DCT, converting it to integers, deleting some data, inverting the DCT, and then rounding that to integers, I get this which is, okay, so 48 to 41, 54 to 66, 80 to 76. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm noticing obvious errors here, but the result is still close to my original. It, it, it displays the same pattern of values, even though each value is off by, I don't know, four or five or six. Um, and that's the result of deleting 40% uh, of the data. Um, now, uh, if I go back to my previous example, I actually want to make one more point about this. So we saw this example where I delete the first coefficient um, and the result came out to be way off. One observation I'll make that I'll come back to in a couple of slides is, so when I do that, I delete the first coefficient, the result is way off. It actually turns out that the result is way off by a constant shift. And the reason is because the first coefficient of the DCT corresponds to a cosine wave with frequency zero. It actually corresponds to a horizontal line, uh, which means if you change that first coefficient, you are basically shifting the result of the inverse up or down by some constant amount. The fact that it's this number is not something we should dwell on, but you'll observe that if I just take that DCT and I add this constant to every value, I do get something that's now within rounding distance of my original data. That's just an observation to make. It's the, the first coefficient has some special significance that we're going to come that, that we want to explore a little bit, and it's true for both 1D and 2D DCTs. Um, but we'll look at a few more examples. Um, so here's a much longer sequence, and I compute the DCT, and it's this. So let's discard. Let's just see what happens if we throw away certain coefficients, just to emphasize that early coefficients are important and later coefficients are uh, less important, or that we can sacrifice that data more readily. Um, and the reason we can do that isn't because the data is really that less important. It's because if we delete these coefficients, the error that we create gets spread out much more efficiently among the different pieces of data. So suppose I delete the second coefficient, and we, we should know by now the instinct should be this coefficient is too early. If I delete it, I'm going to get a, a, some big error. If I take the inverse, I do get some big errors. So I get 20, 23, 20 instead of 15, 18, 16. They do seem to be quite a bit off. Um, but now I can actually look at the error. Let's actually catalog the amount of error per thing. So uh, per element of S, I'll just look at the difference between the original sequence and the result of my inverse DCT. Negative 5.9, negative 5.3. Wait a minute. And over here, I've got 5.9, 5.3. Huh. It looks sort of like the amount of error, even though the values of S and S prime are different at every step, so 15 versus 20 down here versus 27 versus 21 up here, even though the values of S and S prime are different, the error has a very noticeable pattern. So the error values seem to be sort of periodic. They seem to have a sort of the hint at maybe a wave-like pattern. If I look at this progression here, so just picking out some key points, if I were to plot that, it sort of reminds me of this shape. I might be looking at um, the, the trough of, uh, of a wave up to the peak of that wave at the halfway across um, its frequency. Okay, that's sort of interesting. Um, and let's try deleting a later coefficient. So instead of deleting the second coefficient, we'll delete the third coefficient. If I delete the third coefficient, at least qualitatively, subjectively, it looks like there's a bit less error in my result. That shouldn't surprise me too much. But let's look at the error behavior. And here, um, in general, because higher coefficients correspond to higher frequency waves, deleting that third coefficient affects a higher frequency contribution to my to my original signal. And so it shouldn't surprise me that the error is, that the periodic behavior of the error is a little bit higher frequency. So here, the error looks like it goes from positive 1 down to negative 1.8, 
and back up to positive 1.8. So it looks sort of like this. Um, more or less, it looks like one complete um, iteration of that wave, so from peak to peak. And uh, I shouldn't be surprised that uh, if I were to delete later and later coefficients, I'm going to observe that. Because really what the DCT is, is it's telling me how to construct my original sequence out of cosine waves, starting with low frequency waves on this end and high frequency waves over here. If I clear out one of those waves, the error that gets introduced corresponds to the wave that I removed. And in this case, it so the periodic behavior shouldn't surprise me that much. Uh, okay, let's try deleting a later coefficient. If I take the same sequence and delete the ninth coefficient, okay, first observation, what I get is really close to my original input. I haven't introduced that much, that, that huge of an error contribution to my original input. And if I take a look at the error terms specifically, okay, negative 2, 6, okay, 0.67, negative 8, 3. So it's going, um, it's starting negative and going up and down and up and down. Um, not quite like that, but it's going from a small, uh, this may be, sort of like this. Um, and what I think is probably happening here is actually this is a higher frequency wave, maybe something like this, but not. Uh, but because it's so high frequency, I'm not always getting it exactly at the bottom of the trough or the top of the peak. I'm going to really try and draw that so it actually makes some sense. Um, I'm having a peak above here and then down to a trough here and up again. So the idea is when, I, when I'm actually looking at this value, I'm not actually getting the very bottom of that wave. I'm getting sort of some, some part of the way to the bottom, whereas negative 0.83 might be actually hitting the wave near the bottom of it. Um, but in any event, the error behavior is definitely periodic. I notice very regular errors that oscillate between negative and positive values. The frequency is so high at this point, it's actually hard to see what the wave really looks like because I'm only hitting the wave at strange sporadic intervals. Um, but the reason why deleting these higher frequency components is actually that helpful isn't because the higher frequency components are less important per se. It's because when I delete the high frequency component, the, the frequency means that the error gets distributed very evenly between things. Whereas if my error corresponds to a low frequency component, well then some of my data points, so here's the one where I deleted the second coefficient, some of my data points have low error and some of them have huge error. And that's because the error corresponds to this waveform and the waveform has a low frequency. So it's, it's moving very slowly. So if I happen to hit that waveform in the middle, so I guess around here, the waveform, the error turns out to be pretty low. Whereas if the waveform's contribution is high up at its peak or its trough, the error is correspondingly high. That's the reason why in an absolute sense, the high frequency components are easier to sacrifice. Although I might still be introducing the same amount of error in a, in a weird absolute way, the error gets diffused much more evenly among all the elements because the wave that corresponds to that coefficient is moving relatively quickly. So that's one overarching reason why high frequency components are a good um, target if I'm deleting information. Another one is what those really represent in an image sense. And that is, it turns out the high frequency waves, if we interpret an image with a cosine transform, tend to correspond to fine grained details, something that a human viewer wouldn't miss as much as more um, uh, obvious monolithic details like transitions or uh, boundaries between regions of color. So uh, basically, because the, the coefficients at higher indices correspond to higher frequency waves, manipulating those results in errors that diffuse more broadly. That's the ultimate reason that that's a valuable manipulation, manipulating high, the higher frequency coefficients versus the lower ones. Um, whereas if I manipulate the coefficients for lower, uh, the lower indices, the lower frequency coefficients, then I will have these errors that are concentrated in more identifiable regions, so the peaks or troughs of that wave. Um, the first coefficient of the DCT has real, as a, spe a special significance because it corresponds to a constant function. And you can think of that constant function sort of being a wave where every point is a peak or a trough. So if I manipulate that first coefficient, I am actually globally shifting the y value of the entire function when I'm done the inverse. So of course, that first coefficient is sort of special. It corresponds to a wave with frequency zero. Now we have to introduce some weird naming. This is also weird historical stuff coming out of signal processing. So we are using a DCT in a, uh, a fashion considerably different from where these terms came from. But the idea is the first coefficient corresponds to a constant shift. 
it is. So, you know, you could be looking at this x and y axis. The first coefficient is just shifting the entire function up or down, whereas every other coefficient corresponds to some multiple of a waveform. And so historically, um, these coefficients have been given special names. The first coefficient is called the DC coefficient, and the other coefficients are called AC coefficients by analogy with direct current and alternating current. So direct current um, is, is well, I'll start with alternating current. Alternating current oscillates up and down. Um, so of course, it looks a lot like the, uh, the waves corresponding to the second and greater coefficients. Direct current is either on or off. For, for, to, to really oversimplify things, direct current, you either have the voltage or you don't. It does not oscillate between, it doesn't oscillate like alternating current does. So because the DC coefficient corresponds to this constant waveform, it is called the DC coefficient by analogy with direct current. Whereas the AC coefficients oscillate up and down and therefore are closer to alternating current. That is something that we have inherited, terminology that we've inherited from signal processing, which has inherited it from somewhere else in electrical engineering, because they do a lot of signal processing in power systems, I suppose, and so they begin to give names to stuff. But why do we care, Bill? Why do we care about this in a compression course? Well, unfortunately, whether we like it or not, this terminology is still used by compression people. So in the JPEG standard, it talks about DC and AC coefficients. That It uses those words. So we have to know them. We have to learn a little bit about electrical engineering, whether we want to or not. Um, so because we have this, this nice property where the ordering of the coefficients gives us an easy hint about which information to throw away, that is the later coefficients, the DCT is a great option for compression. It gives us um, the same thing we had in the previous lecture for colors, but it gives, us to us, it gives it to us for image details. Um, if I wanted to attenuate image details, I should begin by deleting the higher order coefficients of the DCT. Now, although I could just delete the coefficients, that's not very granular. I, I don't want to have the choice of either keeping the coefficient at high precision or deleting it altogether. What I would rather do is change the accuracy that I'm representing the coefficients with. So I, I want to be able to gradually roll off the number of bits that I'm using for each coefficient, as opposed to either having them or not having them. Uh, and so to do this, typically we, we, we would call this process quantization. That's actually another term out of signal processing, but I think it's actually a very apt term to use here. So JPEG does this, and we're going to follow a very similar model to what JPEG does does. Um, the reason why quantization is helpful, it allows us a, a much finer grained control over what information we throw away. The reason why that's helpful is depending on your setting, you might need to make different adjustments to accommodate the parameters of your input. So the properties of an image can differ depending on the type of Im image you're working with. So if I'm working with line art, that is to say well-defined shapes that I might draw or something like that, in line art it's pretty common to see abrupt transitions between a, I don't know, this, this red triangle and the white background or something like that. Um, and that means that the type of the, the, the facets you see of the image, so how color transitions happen, could be way different than they are in photography. In a photo, it's pretty likely that color transitions happen somewhat gradually. So if you think of the bowl of fruit salad from the, from the previous couple of lectures, um, there were lots of color transitions that were a sort of gradual fade between a dark shade and a light shade. In line art, color transitions are more likely to be a abrupt. Um, and that means that the compression characteristics of the image can differ. And so having some fine-grained control over how those coefficients are attenuated can be very helpful. That's why the quantization process that I'm about to talk about is sort of nice. So how does quantization work? Well, first off, in JPEG, quantization is couched as an extension of the rounding that happens before we store the coefficients. So we do JPEG does not store real value DCT coefficients. Everything must be rounded to an integer. The quantization sort of sits on top of that. Before we do the rounding, we uh, reduce the magnitude of the value. And that means when we round it off, we're deleting more information from the value. And I'll show an example of that in a minute. Um, JPEG and, and other image processing schemes, like the ones you're going to write, obviously use two-dimensional DCTs. We haven't seen those yet. They're not that exciting. They don't change that much about the process. I'm going to illustrate the quantization process on one-dimensional DCTs. And I, I, I'll bet you can figure out how to apply it to a two-dimensional case pretty easily. 
All right, so we'll begin. I'm going to define s to be a vector of n input values. I will assume, because we're building up to processing images here, that s, the values of s are integers in the range 0 through 255. And I will let d be the DCT of my sequence s. I'm going to define a quantization vector q, and we can think of q for quantization vector, or as a shorthand, a rule of thumb, the quantization vector helps you determine the quality setting of your result. So the quantization vector q, you can think of it as the quality parameter. Uh, q is going to be a vector of the same length as s with values in the range 1 through 255. And um, one or, or lower values correspond to higher quality. So the larger the quantization vector's value is, the more I'm going to reduce the quality of that coefficient. OK, so how do I do the quantization? Um, I take the values of my DCT, I div and these are still real numbers at this point. They still can have a fractional component. I divide them by the corresponding quantization value, and then I round the result to an integer. Um, let's try a couple of, let's just do an example of this. Um, so let's suppose that my DI is equal to 15.2. And suppose now that qi is equal to, well, let's start with something easy. We'll start with 1. In that case, ti is going to be equal to the result of rounding. I'm not sure what's, I don't think there's a symbol we can use for that. We'll just write the word round. I want to round 15.2 over 1 to an integer, which means I get 15. OK, so notice with a quantizer value of 1, I end up keeping my original value up to rounding to an integer. Um, to recover the uh, value before I do the inverse DCT, so the decompressor will take the value ti, and it will multiply it by the quantizer to get back the value of d. So in this case, di prime equals 15 times 1, which is just 15. OK, so basically, the decompressor ends up getting pretty much the same value that I had to begin with, except that I rounded it to an integer. Let's try increasing the quantizer value. So suppose I use a quantizer value of 2. OK, so then what I'm doing is I'm rounding the value of 15.2 over 2, which will be, what, I guess 7.6. So I round that, it ends up being 8. All right, so then to com the, 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 I send the value 8 to the decompressor. Notice how the magnitude of my value is much lower than it was to begin with because I divided it by 2. And this is great because if I do this with a lot of values, the average magnitude will be relatively small. Um, OK, so I take the 8. The decompressor then gets this value 8. And to recover the coefficient, it takes the 8 and multiplies it by qi. So this will be, um, this will be ti times qi. It multiplies that by 2, and it gets 16. And you can see this, of course, has an error over what I was trying to send. The quanti And that's the point of the quantizer. I send the value 8. I've reduced the accuracy. Let's use a quantizer value of 3. If I divide 15.2 by 3 and round to an integer, I'm just going to call it and say that's going to be 5. OK, so I'm sending the value 5. Again, notice the lower magnitude of the value. For the decompressor to recover the coefficient, it multiplies 5 times 3. And it just happens, you know, by good luck, it gets the value 15. Uh, but I'm sending only the value 5. Um, let's do, I want to do at least one more. Let's try a quantizer value of uh, 7. OK, so 15 over 7 would round down to 2. So, so, I mean, the, the two nearest multiples of 7 are 14 and 21. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume it rounds down to 2. So I send the value 2 to the decompressor. And to recover it, the decompressor takes 2 and multiplies it by 7 and gets 14. I'm sending a very low magnitude value. In exchange, I might have a large error that's, that results. One other thing you should notice is that means if the decompressor is reconstructing, if all I'm sending over is t, the decompressor needs both the value of t and the value of q. It needs to know the quantity quantization vector that I'm using. Maybe that's been hard coded into the decompressor. Maybe I send that along as overhead. But the decompressor needs the quantizers. It needs the elements of Q. OK, so hopefully you've got the general idea of how this process works, and maybe some intuitive understanding of why it will save us some space. Because what I end up sending, the value of t, will have a smaller and smaller magnitude with larger and larger values of my quantizers qi. All right, so we'll do some examples that show that off in, in more detail. Uh, OK, so here, let's take our s from earlier. Here's our quantization vector. In this case, I'm using powers of 2. I start with a quantizer of 2, and I go up to a quantizer of 32. I take my DCT, I divide each element by the corresponding quantizer, and I round, and I get this. 
So instead of having 110, then 22, then negative 43, I have 55, so that's the quantizer of 2, then 5, negative 5, 1, 0. The magnitudes go way down as I get further into my vector. And hopefully you can see the doors opening up to us. If we're sending over these numbers, suddenly with all these small magnitudes, things like prefix coding or RLE or delta compression become more viable. Sending this with delta compression likely wouldn't help me very much because the delta values could be large. But but after I've performed quantization, my numbers are closer together. Maybe it's even possible I've got multiple values in a row that are the same, especially as we'll see later, a lot of zeros. Um, so if I want to decompress, I take that value of t. I compute d prime by multiplying each value by the corresponding quantizer, so 2, 4, uh, 8, 16, and 32, and then I take the inverse DCT and I end up with this reconstructed sequence. Um, I can look at the error. I have to be a little bit careful here. Um, so S prime, the actual result of the inverse DCT is shown in this table, whereas the S prime that I've, that I've drawn here, this is the result rounded to integers. I wanted to show this from two different sides. So um, if I look at just taking the inverse uh, DCT, that's, that's actually this. Really, I should have been writing this is actually just the DCT negative one. Um, and the errors that I get are, it, it's not, I don't know that they're that bad, um, but on the other hand, I, I've eliminated a lot of data. So the errors are one, negative 0.8, and then this error here is 5.5. So there are some larger ones. Um, keep in mind though that a fair comparison should be comparing the rounded value, so 47 um, and then 55. So we can see the actual value, but really because we know we're rounding to ints, if we want to do an error comparison, it should actually be versus the rounded value. And so the first error is it's off by one, this one's off by one, this one's off by six. This one here is off by two, and this one here is off by three. Uh, if I use a different quantization vector, notice how this vector, the magnitudes are smaller. So the quantizers are smaller, that means quality should be higher. Um, if I do that, I send this for t. This is going to be harder for me to compress because it's got a larger range of values, but I end up getting this, where the actual error terms themselves are generally lower, but there are still some large errors. There are still errors like this one. Okay, and we can generalize that to even larger sequences. So we know that modifying higher order coefficients tends to diffuse the resulting error better. Uh, and so in general, that means I'm, I have some motivation to choosing quantizer vectors that ramp up, that ramp up maybe gradually, maybe abruptly, but starting at small values to large values. So in this one, I've decided to quantize by transmitting the first few coefficients at very high precision, at full precision besides rounding, and then suddenly slam the quantizers up to 30. If I look at the transmitted data, that means that the first few values are going to be in a very large range because I'm transmitting them with no real quantization. And then the last few values are suddenly going to be relatively small because they've been quantized so much. Of course, that means these values down here are now uh, perfect subjects for RLE or delta compression or something. Um, when I reconstruct, I end up with um, this reconstructed vector here. And the relative error is generally pretty low. So each on each of them, it's, it's generally in the single digits, although there are a few samples where the error is pretty bad. Um, those tend to be samples that sort of jump out a bit from the, the, uh, the sequence otherwise. So if the sequence tends to be hovering around a specific thing and there are values that suddenly jump up or down, often those are the places where we have um, uh, larger errors. So in this case, we go from 59 down to 26, but then back up to 50. Whereas we do jump here from 58, we jump up by about 40 or so, but we stay up there long enough that maybe the error can be diffused better. But we, we shouldn't try and read too much into that. What we could do, though, is look into the fact that the PSNR is 30. So this means that although, yes, there are some places where the error is high and the places where the error is low, uh, broadly speaking, this achieves high quality. 30 or higher is high quality for our purposes. If we try a different quantization vector where I quantize the first few coefficients really aggressively and the rest of them relatively less, then I get a much worse PSNR. So PSNR is logarithmic. So 24 is orders of magnitude worse than 30. So of course, this is just more justification that we should be trying to attenuate the, the higher order coefficients first. Um, modifying the DC coefficient, so performing, although you can quantize a DC coefficient, modifications to the DC coefficient do tend to result in, in pretty stark differences in your result. So, I mean, here we go from having 31 in my um, input data to 42, and 41 to 49, I do have some pretty nasty errors showing up. 
Uh, I can still quantize um, lower order coefficients if I want to. There's nothing wrong with that, but I should be more careful about that. If I want to ramp up and do aggressive quantization, I should try and ramp up somewhat gradually uh, like I'm doing here. So I am quantizing more and more as I go from left to right, but I'm still trying to keep those first few coefficients relatively accurate because it seems like that's where errors are most likely to be visible if I quantize those too aggressively. Um, one other thing I should observe is if you have a bunch of input values that are highly correlated, so if you look, if you think about like adjacent pixels in a photograph, it's pretty unlikely you're going to see stuff like five and then a hundred and then five again in a photograph. You are going to see, however, in many cases, long runs of similar pixels, maybe a, a building color gradient or just a blurry area with pixels that have similar values. Um, when you have that situation, aggressive quantization can yield pretty good results. Um, so here, I'm quantizing everything by 16. And notice that results in a transmitted vector that's 21 followed by a ton of zeros. And so this is going to be great for RLE. Uh, and then my reconstructed data, of course, is, is sort of boring. It's a bunch of 106s. But on the other hand, my original data was pretty close to 106. So I'm not introducing that much error by quantizing like this. Um, and we'll see later when we see about the way that, that the DCT actually works inside of JPEG. We often actually are taking DCTs of about this length. Um, although I'm going to show off what happens if we take a DCT of an entire image. In JPEG, uh, and in most image and video compression schemes, we only take DCTs of small pieces of the image at once, maybe 8 by 8 or 16 by 16 or 32 by 32 blocks. And so in the event that one 8 by 8 block, 8 pixels by 8 pixels is not very much. In the event that an 8 by 8 block has relatively low detail, it can be quantized pretty harshly compared to other 8 by 8 blocks that capture more detail. Um, okay, so um, here I've got a similar set uh, of highly correlated input values. Um, it's not the same set as before, so of course they're all hovering around the same value uh, in both cases. I'm quantizing them both aggressively, and in both cases we come up with this vector of transmitted values that is one larger value and a bunch of relatively small values that would benefit from delta compression and or RLE. All right, so what about images? What do we do with a two-dimensional DCT? Hopefully by now we have some comfort with, okay, the DCT is a way of representing our input in terms of a sum of waveforms. Although that might be creepy, hopefully we can at least agree that there are a bunch of these cosine waves and each coefficient corresponds to a higher frequency wave. If I want to modify the DCT, it makes sense to modify the higher frequency waves first. Uh, so how do I apply that from the 1D case? How do I take that into images? Well, there's such thing as the 2D DCT. There it is, have fun. There's the 2D inverse DCT. Um, so we can represent a, we, we saw in the one dimensional case that if I have a 1D array of, of stuff, my function is a 1D sequence, my DCT will be a 1D sequence of coefficients of the same length. The same thing is true of images. If I have an m by n image, the DCT is also going to be an n by m, a 2D array of coefficients. I can compute the 2D DCT, so each of those coefficients is just, so the value of coefficient ij is the value of this function. So it's going to be a pretty nasty looking 2D loop over the image. Um, I could compute it directly, or I can compute it with linear algebra as before. So what's neat about the 2D DCT is that it uses a the same matrix that we used for the 1D DCT. So if I have a square image, if my input array is an n by n array, and we could think of a as being the image, the pixel values for the image, um, I can compute the 2D DCT of a by first computing the n by n matrix C that we saw on slide 67, so about half an hour ago, I guess. And then if I want the DCT, I just multiply on both sides. I multiply by the transpose on the right and the uh, non-transpose matrix on the left. And then if I want to invert that DCT, so if the DCT is C times a times C transpose, I then just have to get rid of these C's basically. So I can multiply by C transpose here and C here. Because C transpose is the same as C inverse, you'll notice that what I end up with are two inverse and non-inverse pairs. And so I'll get back, the, these just cancel out, I just get back the original A. So as I said earlier, um, whether to use the linear algebraic representation to compute your DCT depends on what you're doing. You may not want to keep around generating the n by n matrix if it's a huge 
each value for n might be time consuming. It might be easier just to use the formula. However, if you're going to need to generate a lot of DCTs of the same size, then it makes sense to compute the matrix once and use it over and over again. And we'll notice that that actually is the use case you're likely to have. So it's very likely for your DCTs in assignment three and four, you will use um, the linear algebraic version. You'll create the matrix C, and then you'll use matrix multiplication to compute the DCT. Um, so uh, the slides are now agreeing with me on this. Um, and in particular, with JPEG style usage of DCTs, all of the image blocks are eight by eight. So if you compute that eight by eight, uh, matrix C once, or even hard code it into your source code, because it's always going to be eight by eight, um, then you could just use it over and over again. You can save all the time it takes to compute it. And th that's one reason why using the matrix version could be helpful for your purposes. So what does a DCT look like? Um, in the one dimensional case, the coefficients of a DCT, so if I look at like, if I have a DCT that's three coefficients. Each coefficient corresponds to a multiple of a waveform. The first coefficient will be a horizontal line. The second coefficient will be a, a, a relatively low frequency wave. And the third coefficient will be a higher frequency wave. Um, what does that look like in two dimensions, though? Well, in two dimensions, our coefficients, so we have this 2D array of coefficients. And uh, the coefficient up here, our, our DC coefficient will actually be, be this. I'll come back to that later. But coefficients in different parts of our coefficient array basically correspond to different ways of combining together horizontal, horizontal and vertical waveforms. So here's the coefficient at index 2, 2. So there's index 0, 0, and then there's index 1, 1, and there's index 2, 2. The coefficient at index 2, 2 in, an, in a 2D DCT corresponds to this waveform. And you'll notice the waveform, if you look at it carefully and you observe the brightness changes are differences in are, are the, the actual waves are exhibited mostly in brightness changes here. What I have horizontally is a wave that goes from a low value to a high value and back again. What I have vertically is the same thing, but vertical, basically. So this bright spot in the center is where a, when I combine together, when I take the product of both horizontal and vertical waves, um, they both reach a peak at once. This gray area is where the um, vertical wave is reaching a peak, but the horizontal wave is, is sitting about even. And this black area is where one wave is hitting a trough. Um, and so you can see this sort of blurry checkerboard pattern being produced by horizontal waves um, and vertical waves that are being meshed together. Here's the coefficient for 4, 4. So you can again see that nice periodicity. So there's high, there's low, there's high, there's low. Um, and I see the same thing vertically. And this is because the 2D DCT is considered to be the transposition of horizontal waves, and, or sorry, vertical waves and horizontal waves. That's why there is a certain axis alignment present, a certain checkerboard pattern. If I look at coefficients that are off the diagonal, so the waveform for 4, 4, um, that would be, so here's 0, 0, there's 1, 1, so 4, 4 is somewhere down here. Um, the waveform for 4, 4 is uh, pretty symmetric looking. But the waveform for coefficient 4, 2, so row 4, column 2, that would be sort of here, so below the diagonal, notice how um, that means that the horizontal and vertical waves have different frequencies, and therefore we'll get this sort of elongated pattern. The horizontal wave, so co you know, co coefficient Oh, whoops, that's, this would be xy coordinates. So this would be x is 4, y is 2. Um, the horizontal wave has a high frequency. The vertical wave has a lower, whoops, has a lower frequency. Um, and so we get this elongated thing. What we're actually doing then with a 2D DCT is we are writing, we are rewriting our image in a sense as a linear combination of all of these different patterns. I've got this pattern, this pattern, this pattern, this pattern, and numerous others. And I am then rewriting my image as a combination of all of these, laying all of these on top of each other and taking their sum, and in some cases, and taking their sum weighted by negative 128, basically. Um, and so notice how the really high frequency waveforms, coefficients like width over 4, height over 4, for an image of this size, which is pretty big, have this extremely fine level of detail. And that means that the contribution of this coefficient to my image will probably be focused on fine details, because that's what it, it has this very fine resolution, such that I actually am sort of getting seasick even staring at it for longer than a few seconds at a time. 
Um, and that means that just like in the one dimensional case, if I were to remove the contribution of this particular waveform, it would probably have less of a globally observable impact than if I remove the contribution of, I don't know, this waveform here. If I delete the contribution of this waveform, then some areas of my image are suddenly going to be lighter than others, and some of them are going to be darker than others. Because my image was created as a sum of all of these waveforms, if I knock out this one, there will be very noticeable uh, problems with my image. So dark area will show up here, a bright area will show up here, because this brightness is no longer canceling out the darkness of all the other waveforms, and this darkness is no longer canceling out the brightness of all the other waveforms. Uh, and so just like in the one-dimensional case, we can see why maybe focusing our attention on these high-frequency components will result in less of a loss of perceivable detail than the low-frequency ones. So what does that mean? Well, in practice, we tend to do DCTs on small pieces of our input, on 8 by 8 blocks. And there would be tons of, this, this image here is 500 by 338. So there would be tons of 8 by 8 blocks. There would be what, like 40 8 by 8 blocks? Um, that's way less than 40. There would be tons of 8 by 8 blocks in this image. So DCTs are, are done on a pretty small scale. But we can talk about what would happen to an image if we do the DCT on the scale of the entire image. So in this example, I have truncated the DCT to 50% of the width and height of the image. So what I mean by that is I've computed the DCT of the entire image, a 2D array of coefficients the same size as the image. Then I've gone in and I have taken all of the coefficients not in this upper quadrant. So I, I, this is 50% of the height, and this is 50% of the width. Um, and I've taken all the coefficients in there and left them alone, but I've cleared out all of the coefficients elsewhere. I've truncated them, I've deleted them. So I've deleted three quarters of the data of the image here, basically. I've transformed it to a DCT and then deleted 75% of the information of the DCT and inverted the DCT. And you can take a look at that and tell me if you can see any problems. The, they, they exist. There are artifacts, but it's not too difficult. It's not too easy to see them. The DCT has done a good job of stratifying detail. The stuff I deleted was very fine-grained detail, stuff that maybe you're not going to notice at all. There's the image. There's the result of truncating the DCT by 50% in both dimensions, which means it's now 25% of the total no uh, uh, amount of information that I started with. Um, if you want to go looking for artifacts, you will find them. Here are some artifacts. Here are some artifacts. But they're pretty subtle. And even when you see them, they're not that intrusive. They don't really, they don't feel as wrong as some of the other artifacts we've seen. And high detail areas seem to be preserved. And I see much of the salience of the image has been preserved. Um, here, I've truncated the DCT down to 25%. So now the, what I've done is I've, uh, uh, I've, I've reduced the, the amount of information I'm storing to 1 16th of the previous amount. I set all the other coefficients to zero. I completely eliminate them. In this case, there is an observable effect. I, something weird happens. It just seems like a blur, although there's a weird textured appearance that shows up that I can't quite pin down. It's, it's sort of noticeable here and here as well. Try pulling up the slides and zooming in on it. There is a particular impression that I get from this form of artifact. You can see it a little bit here. Um, if you look at, let's say, this area or this area, maybe the effect I see is sort of like ripples on the surface of water. Or wait, ripples, what's... Waves, that's right, waves on the surface of water. If I look at the artifacts here, I can see sort of the same effect, sort of a ripply effect, like waves um, uh, flowing away from the surface of the pear almost. If we try it with color images, it makes sense to combine this with subsampling. So what, we, what we're doing here is uh, we'll take our color image, convert to YCBCR, subsample, so the, the CB and CR color planes are scaled down by, two, by a factor of two in both dimensions, and then I take the DCT of those color planes, uh, of all three color planes, and truncate it by 50% in each dimension. That means that what I'm storing in the Y component, I'm storing one quarter of the original information because I take the DCT, I truncate it down to one quarter or, or to one half of its original size in both dimensions. But for the two chroma planes, CB and CR, I'm storing one sixteenth the original information because I scale the plane down by a factor of two and then I truncate the DCT by a factor of two again. So it ends up being one sixteenth of its original resolution. So there's the original image and there's the result of doing that. So I, I have eliminated more than 75% of the original data. Uh, or sorry, not more than 75%. I've, I've eliminated more than 50% of, no wait, yeah, that's more than 75%. I've eliminated 75% of the Y plane and 15 sixteenths of the two chroma planes. So I'm looking at less than 25% than of my original input size, and this is what it looks like. 
It looks pretty nice. I'm noticing a very faint um, loss of sharpness on the edge of the pear, but I have to really look for that. Um, otherwise, it looks really crisp. I can see some evidence of artifacting happening in the background, that same ripples on water effect, but it's not that big of a deal. It doesn't... Um, affect too globally my perception of the image. And again, I have gotten rid of more than 75% of the data that I started with. Now, if I truncate the DCTs even more, I get the same problem I had before. It's not as noticeable because with the benefit of the color information, uh, I, my, my brain can put more pieces together. But I am noticing an effect, again, sort of like ripples, um, uh, radiating away from boundaries in the image uh, in this case. And it turns out that is the characteristic artifact of DCTs. And I'll talk about that more in a couple of minutes. Um, but here, once I truncate too far, I've deleted too much information. Although the DCT does a good job, it's not good enough um, to ameliorate that effect. Uh, okay, so here's the fruit salad. Here I have uh, taken, here's the original image. Here's where I've truncated the DCT by 50% after subsampling. So now the image is being stored in less than one quarter of its original size. And I don't notice too much that's wrong. I can, if I know to look for the ripple effect, I can see it here. I can see it happening on the edges of watermelon in the background. Um, but I, I don't see too many other noticeable artifacts. And even those are relatively subtle. And again, this is now less than 25% its original size. If I truncate further, um, here I'm truncating 25%, so I'm truncating it down to 25%, so now I'm looking at less than 1 16th, the original size of the image. Um, here I, I do see noticeable artifacts, noticeable these ripple artifacts, what turn out to be called ringing artifacts. Um, they're beginning to show up. So maybe we should talk a bit more about that. What are the characteristic artifacts produced by DCT quantization? We know about the characteristic artifacts for color quantization, that's the banding artifact. We know the artifacts for subsampling, that would be the pixelation artifact. What about DCTs? Um, to illustrate my point, I'm going to construct, I've constructed already this discrete function that is bad news for a DCT. We know that if we choose to interpolate things, there are certain forms, certain shapes that some interpolants really aren't very good at. They can always do it, but in some cases they struggle. So this is an example of a discrete function with what is called a transient. So it is an abrupt magnitude change, one that doesn't seem to be cut, the, where the, um, the signal doesn't seem to catch up to this magnitude change in a way that seems wave-like. So it's one thing to have a symbol that suddenly jumps up, if the symbol then jumps up again a few more times in a way that a wave can sort of can sort of figure that out. Um, here, the symbol, the signal is jumping up once, and then that's it. Um, this is called a transient. If you're familiar with audio processing, you might already know the term. A transient is what you often describe um, a signal like a drum to be. So a drum is something that hits suddenly. It suddenly results in a jump in the signal, and then it goes away. It's not periodic. It just shows up suddenly. And if you know anything about audio processing or audio signal processing or audio compression, you might already know that audio Audio compression schemes often struggle with transient sounds because of the way that um, signal processing based schemes, waveform based schemes struggle with that. So if I were to compute a DCT of this, the waveform I end up with looks like this. And a full DCT with all 20 coefficients will exactly match each of my input points, guaranteed. If I, use all, if I have 20 input points and 20 coefficients, I will always be able to do it. But notice that even so, the DCT does seem to be struggling a little bit. Notice how the waveform does something really funny around that transient. It sort of undershoots by a bit. It's sort of getting ready to jump. And then it jumps up and over shoots and then has to abruptly turn back downwards to, to hit the next point, which is lying flat. But it is able to do it. When you have all 20 coefficients, you're always able to interpolate all 20 points. The problem is, in this example, those high frequency coefficients are very important. They're helping to dampen um, some of the um, this, this, this undershooting and overshooting behavior that we're seeing around the jump. If we begin deleting those high frequency coefficients, something bad's going to happen. Um, okay, so this is all 20. Now let's try deleting some of them. Um, so here I have deleted five coefficients, the last five coefficients. With the last five coefficients deleted, some of the volatility actually seems to have been reduced, strangely. Like we're no longer jumping too far up or too far back down. On the other hand, we aren't quite hitting the things at the top of the transient. 
But actually, if you look nearby the transient, the DCT is doing a good job. All of the points near the transient seem to be pretty close to the line. It turns out that that isn't where the artifact is going to show up. It's going to show up somewhere else. Let's look at the full version. So this is with all 20 coefficients, and here's with only 15. There's 20, there's 15. The pattern you might notice is, sure, we're losing a bit of accuracy around here, but that's fine, we don't mind. That's the point of, of deleting coefficients to begin with. But notice that there's something uncontrolled happening a little bit further out. So here, the function does a decent job with all 20 coefficients of sort of leveling off. It isn't quite leveled off. It does seem to still be oscillating a bit. There's still some volatility that's being echoed outwards from the transient, but it's under control. And that control is brought about in some part by those high frequency coefficients. If I delete the high frequency coefficients, notice that the volatility radiating away from the transient becomes more pronounced because the high frequency waveforms I've removed were necessary to bring these things under control. Now what's happening is the function is overshooting and undershooting the true value of the signal going quite a ways away from the actual source of the problem, from the actual transient. And this overshooting or undershooting is the characteristic artifact. If I perform the inverse DCT, I won't get this point, I'll get this point. And I won't get um, this point, I'll get, uh, I guess I'll get this point here. I'll end up with points that overshoot and undershoot, or actually more likely sort of alternate between overshooting and undershooting. Um, and I'll observe that. I'll observe this effect um, of sort of, this will be dark, then light, then there's too light again, then there's, there's too dark again. A very periodic effect of error radiating outwards from the source of the transient. Um, and the transient in the context of an image might be an abrupt transition between colors. So if I go from fully dark to fully bright suddenly, so that boundary there between fully dark and fully bright, that's going to look like a transient. In audio processing, a transient could be the noise of a drum or some sharp sudden sound. Um, what's interesting is that the artifact we're looking at is called a ringing artifact. Because if you actually look at the waveform that we get as a result of this, um, and this could show up not just in a compression setting, but also in um, sampling. So if I'm trying to capture a signal digitally by sampling it, I have to choose my sampling frequency carefully because these artifacts can show up if I don't sample at a high enough frequency. But in any event, they're called ringing because this waveform is a ringing uh, waveform. It, it's a, uh, a waveform that's oscillating uniformly and decays. That's a terrible example. Um, it's a waveform that's oscillating uniformly Normally at a specific frequency, but, but the amplitude gets smaller and smaller. It decays. So it's like the ringing of a bell. If you ring a bell, you hear the same frequency, but with lower and lower volume as time goes by. So they're called ringing artifacts for that reason. In images, I also think of them as ringing artifacts because they can often be visible as rings, um, but ringing comes from ringing of a bell. Uh, in images, this will show up to, in a, with an effect that I think is similar to ripples in water. In an audio signal, it would be uh, heard as a pre-echo effect, which is very disturbing. So if in your original audio signal a drum hits here, you don't want to hear the drum before it hits. But you'll notice that in this signal, as a result of removing some of my high-frequency waveforms, I get some volatility showing up. If this is an audio signal and this is time, then this volatility is, is present because of the drum drum that hasn't happened yet. So you actually will hear the drum a little bit before the drum has actually been has actually hit, which is weird. So that's called pre-echo. You actually pre-hear a transient before it occurs. Now this happens on the order of usually milliseconds or something, but it is audible. You will notice this in badly in badly sampled audio or badly compressed audio. I'd love to give a lecture on audio compression, but the course is running out of time. So to demonstrate this visually, let's construct an image with a, with a very visible and obvious transient. Now, in our 2D DCT, which is the product of, of 1D waveforms arranged at right angles, the most um, jarring transient is one that just has these horizontal um, or vertical lines. Uh, and so I've created this transient, a black box on a white background. It's, it's a fully black box and a fully white background. And that means that the transition between them is as much of a transient as I can construct. We go from full brightness uh, down to full darkness and then back up again to full brightness. So if I uh, perform the same uh, pipeline I was on my color images from earlier, I subsample, even though the subsampling should do nothing, but for fairness I will still do that, I subsample and then truncate the DCT pretty dramatically, I get this. 
This is not necessarily that noticeable to you looking at your screen for a lot of different reasons, so I will show an enhanced version in a minute. But if you zoom in, you probably will see some artifacts radiating away from these edges, these transient edges of the image. Um, if I truncate the DCT even more, if I get rid of even more high frequency components, the artifacts are more visible and you can see them lasting for longer. They, they radiate further away. Um, the artifacts actually do radiate in all directions, but they're because the waveforms I'm using are aligned horizontally and vertically, and because there's a certain amount of cancellation happening out here, you tend to observe them more radiating uh, directly away from the edge. In a sense, the direction that they radiate is sort of the normal vector of the edge uh, away from which they are radiating. So here's the image. There's the DCT truncated 25%. There it is truncated um, down to 12.5%, so even further. Um, and then here is a higher contrast version. So I, I have digitally enhanced the image. This is not what the image actually looks like. I have it deliberately exaggerated the contrast so you can hopefully see the artifacts more. Notice how the artifacts are periodic and they fade out. They are decaying over time. So like the ringing of a bell, these ringing artifacts. Also notice there is something happening diagonally. It's just not quite clear what it is. It's this weird checkerboard. So what's happening is there are still ar there is still artifacting happening out here, but it, to some extent the artifacts from the horizontal and vertical cancel each other. That's why we get this, this checkerboard pattern. And also the artifacts are stronger in horizontal and vertical directions because that's the alignment uh, of the waveform because uh, the shape itself has corners. Um, if we want to see what happens if the transient doesn't have those sharp corners, oh wait, the, yeah, there is an even more exaggerated version. So this is Mac the contrast has been maxed out. Um, and we can see a very periodic um, uh, decay or a very, very periodic radiation of artifacts away from uh, the edges of the transient. Here I've put a circle, a black circle on a white background. I have removed all anti-aliasing, so you can see the circle actually has sort of jagged edges a little bit, so that, that way there is, I'm guaranteed to have the absolute maximum difference between uh, pixels inside the circle and pixels outside the circle. So the transient is, is as high as possible. There's no slope. It just goes vertically downwards from, or upwards from darkness to brightness. If I truncate the DCT down to one quarter its original size, um, then I get this. If I truncate it down to one eighth, I get this. Um, and if I enhance, I get this. So here's the contrast enhanced version. You'll notice that still the artifacts favor the horizontal and vertical directions, but they do radiate outwards in every direction from the, uh, the transient, which means that no direction is safe. I can see these ringing artifacts, and here they do look more like rings on a pond or waves in water. Um, I see the ringing artifacts more um, uh, in the horizontal and vertical directions, but I still see them in every direction. So I, I can't try and only compensate horizontally and vertically. If I have a transient aligned in any direction, I should expect to see some artifacting. If I max out the contrast, you can sort of see the pattern. Over time, the diagonal directions have less artifacts, but there are still artifacts radiating away from the center in all directions. Okay, so that's, that's the artifacting situation. Now let's talk about JPEG. So JPEG was developed, JPEG stands for Joint Photographic Experts Group. It was developed by an institution now, an organization now called ITUT in the early 90s. It was developed by an organization whose job it was to design international telecommunication standards, a standards body. So you can expect that the JPEG standard is written very formally. It is not like the Deflate standard, which is one of its contemporaries. So JPEG and Deflate are sort of cousins. They came up in the same basic general area of time, and they share a lot of techniques, and they share a lot of philosophical um, uh, things in common, but they are written way differently. Deflate is, is in, in incorporated, eventually end up uh, being encapsulated in RFC 1951, which is relatively informal. JPEG was written up in a very, very formal and stuffy sort of standards document. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in the next few slides. Um, lots of other lossy image formats exist. Tons, but JPEG is still the reigning champion. Everybody still uses JPEG. There are formats that are increasingly catching on. So one of them that I like is WebP. Uh, whoops, WebP. Um, but I think the techniques used by JPEG are generalizable to other um, uh, compression formats. So learning about JPEG because it's still um, large and in charge, it's still the reigning champion, and because modern schemes derive a lot from JPEG, I think learning about JPEG is still a good idea. 
So a typical JPEG image, JPEG provides compressors with lots of authority to make decisions, but a typical JPEG image has probably undergone the following. We represent the image in YCBCR. We perform chroma subsampling by 50%, either horizontally, vertically, or both. In other words, you are allowed to have an image where you only subsample by getting rid of horizontal resolution or only vertical resolution. But in general, you'll probably do 420, which is where you um, scale down the color plane uniformly by a factor of two in both dimensions to 50% of its previous uh, of its original size. We, you, we leave the Y plane at its original size. We then take the result divide it up into 8 by 8 blocks. I'll talk more about that in a minute. For each 8 by 8 block, we apply the DCT and then some quantization. We then take those quantized coefficients and encode them using a sort of delta-ish encoding. So basically differential encoding with um, some uh, modification to allow for prefix coding. And then we use Huffman coding or some other form of entropy coding to encode those differentially encoded coefficients. I am not going to go into great detail about any of these steps. I'm going to talk about these steps in, to some amount of detail, but not too much. The latter steps are basically just a new form of lossless compression scheme. A lot of it is very similar to deflate or to bzip, so we won't worry about that in fine detail. Um, so, like a lot of these big standards, JPEG actually has lots of features that nobody uses. So JPEG has actually always included support for arithmetic coding, but nobody seems to use that. It, generally, JPEG compressors use Huffman coding because they have the option, and I think because when JPEG came of age, everybody was scared of arithmetic coding because it was slow and because they might get sued. So they never used it, and so people over time just, just uh, fell into a convention of never using arithmetic coding for JPEG. But it does support it, and it supported it all along. JPEG also has a separate mode for lossless image encoding, but nobody seems to use that either. It does seem as if these days, if you want to encode an image losslessly, you'll use PNG. So we're not going to worry about the JPEG lossless pipeline. So after we do color space conversion and subsampling, we now treat each color plane separately. Um, we then take each color plane, divide it up into 8 by 8 blocks, which is pretty small. Um, if the resolution of the color plane is not divisible by 8, so for example, what if the image is 15 by 15? What we do is pad the image out by just duplicating the last row or column of the image over and over again until the size of the image is a multiple of 8. And then we'll, we'll trim those back off again in decompression. The idea is that way every single block we come up with will be 8 by 8. Um, since each block is processed independently, you only need the 8 by 8 DCT matrix. So it makes sense to pre-compute that, or actually just to hard code it as an array into your source code. You only need one matrix, just hard code it. Um, what's also neat about this is because each block is processed independently, you could even parallelize. You could have different threads, different processors processing the DT DCT of different blocks simultaneously. And because uh, taking the DCT and doing quantization are basic arithmetic, so matrix multiplication and then a bunch of division operations in rounding, um, you could even get a GPU to do that. You could get a GPU to process thousands of DCT blocks at once because the arithmetic we need is, a, is about at the level of arithmetic that GPUs are very good at. If any of you for assignment four as one of the extra features want to do GPU-based uh, DCT computations, then have at it. I would be thrilled to hand out extra marks for that. I really want to see that happen. It's not, not going to be easy, but I would really love to see that happen. Mass parallelization of a DCT. After applying the DCT to our 8x8 blocks, we then perform quantization using a quantization matrix. So we're quantizing a 2D thing. The matrix uh, that we're using, though, we're not performing matrix multiplication or anything. What I'm doing is saying, okay, so if I number my rows starting at 0, um, the way I quantize the element in my uh, DCT block at index row 2, uh, column 1, is by dividing it by this. The way I quantize the thing at row 3, column 2, is by dividing it by this. So the way I I quantize is I just lay my DCT matrix on top of one of these quantization matrices and then divide by each element. Um, in general, so you can use any quantization matrix you want, and there could be reasons a particular compressor makes a different choice depending on what image that they're compressing. And this, this could also involve some logic that involves looking at the image and deciding what we think of, of the characteristics of the image based on that. Um, you can encode any quantization matrix you want into the JPEG file. The JPEG standard recommends, uh, to some extent, I'll bet more on that in a minute, using ma certain matrices just for general purpose use. Um, they recommend using different matrices for luminance, for the Y channel, than for chrominance, so CB and CR, because those two channels have a different perceived level of detail when humans look at them. And you'll notice the 
luminance matrix certainly does a bit less aggressive quantization than the chrominance matrix, or the roll-off is different. In the chrominance matrix, we keep some coefficients at some level of detail and then slam everything up to 99, whereas in the luminance matrix, it's a bit more tricky. Some stuff gets quantized more, and some stuff gets quantized less. And I look at this and say, this matrix, I mean, where did they get this from? I mean, notice how it's not symmetric. So in some way, um, pixels that go across horizontally are somehow more valuable um, than DCT coefficients that go down vertically. That's a little bit weird. That might have something to do with the fact that images are often displayed on, on um, displays with an aspect ratio that results in pixels not being square or something. So the standard actually indicates the reason that they gave these matrices was that they were derived empirically. So that's the usual excuse that you give when you have a matrix that, when you have data that makes no, no sense, has no symmetries or any mathematical beauty, and you want people to get off your case. You say, I'm sorry, I derived these empirically. This is just one of the mysteries of the universe. Um, so fair enough. These, these matrices have been, the experts have, deci have decided that these matrices are good for quantization. But you might ask, what if I need to quantize more or less? What if my compressor, as part of its quality setting, has to reduce space more than this matrix might normally do? Do I need some other quantization? quantization matrix? Well, you could. You could have a separate quantization matrix for low quality and, and a separate one for high quality and use this for medium. Or you could do what the standard suggests, and if you need to quantize more or less, just use multiples of this matrix. So for example, if you divide each quantizer by 2, this goes to 8, this goes to 5, this goes to 5, this goes to 6. If you divide each quantizer by 2, you will be quantizing a bit less. But you'll still have the same pattern of quantization that you have in the original matrix. And the standard points out that if you divide all the quantizers by 2, you will end up with a higher quality image that is virtually nearly, uh, uh, usually nearly indistinguishable from the source image. Similarly, if you want to reduce quality further to save more space, you could multiply each quantizer by 2. If you want to reduce quality a little bit less than that, you could multiply each quantizer by 1.5 and round it to an integer. So you could uh, use a sliding scale of scalar multiples of these matrices as a way of adjusting your quality setting. So a lossy compressor, like the ones you're going to write on assignments 3 and 4, needs to have a quality setting for me to tell it how how much compression do I want? How much quality do I want to lose? Um, and to do that, you just program in this quantization matrix if you want to, and then to adjust the quality, just take multiples of it. Now, in true standards committee form, despite recommending the use of these two matrices, the standard then says these tables are provided as examples only and are not necessarily suitable for any particular application because, I don't know, they don't want to get sued. Like, I'm, for some reason, despite giving the recommendation, they don't want to stand by it. It's, it's your fault if this recommendation doesn't turn out to work out. They're just saying, here are some matrices. Use them, don't use them. We don't care. It's not our fault if they break. Okay, well, I mean, fair enough. That's the standards committee form. For you. They, they can't quite make a definitive statement in cases like this. So they give you the matrix and then say, well, don't take our word for it. Um, you can take my word for it, though. I think these are good quantization matrices. Actually, now that I think about it, I'm providing these tables as examples only, and what I say is not necessarily suitable for any particular application. And that's true of everything I say, not just the stuff on this slide. In any event, it makes sense, whatever matrix you choose, it does seem to make sense to come up with one reference quantization matrix and then use scalar multiples as an easy way to vary quality because it allows you a lot of um, granularity. You, you can, uh, there are a lot of different scalar multiples you can use and you can fine tune the multiples you use for whatever quality setting you want to achieve. Um, okay, so I already said this part. Uh, and then finally, the last part I want to talk about is uh, once it's done quantization, what does it do with the data? It converts the 2D array to a linear sequence um, but it's because it wants to then feed that linear sequence into a lossless compression scheme. So it wants to feed it into, for example, prefix coding. Uh, the problem is doing that uh, is not necessarily obvious. If we were just to take every row uh, one at a time, so I went through all of row one, um, and then I went through, and then I, I skipped down and did all of row two, notice how that might be mashing together important coefficients with less important ones. This is the DC coefficient in a 2D DCT. And in general, um, importance declines as we get further away from the DC coefficient. So if I go row by row, I'll be mixing together very highly quantized values with less quantized values. Whereas what I sort of want is the more quantized stuff should all be together because it's like it all be small values and delta 
compression can make better work of it. So instead, what JPEG uses is a sort of zigzag order. It stores the DC coefficient first. It actually stores that separately. It uses a separate code for that. And then it stores all the other coefficients in a sort of zigzag order, walking through the matrix like this. Um, and here's the, the full ordering. And here's the permutation of values. This, this value is last, um, and this value is first. Um, and so in this way, hopefully, we are putting coefficients of equal value, um, of equal um, qualitative value to us next to each other. Because that means if I heavily quantize these, they'll end up next to each other, and that means that they'll all have similar relatively small values that can be delta compressed. Um, and the DC coefficient is actually held back and kept separate. You can see it's not actually part of the zigzag ordering. So two Huffman codes get used. We actually have one Huffman code defined for the whole image that we use to encode the DC coefficients because they're the constant shift and therefore might have different characteristics than all of the AC coefficients, and then a separate Huffman code used to encode AC coefficients. For the encoding, the, the, the encodings themselves, even after we quantize, our image values are, are, will begin in the range 0 through 255, uh, and our DCT values will end up in that range as well, but they could still have large values and have a very large range. Uh, the DCT values are typically viewed as signed values, so not the range might be 256 in size, but the signed values might be negative 128 to 127. Uh, and so instead of encoding, if we do delta compression on that, that might not yield great results. And instead of encoding those delta values directly with a Huffman code, which requires a very large number of symbols, um, which can decrease compression performance, we instead convert each value to a symbol offset pair. So in the event that your DCT coefficients come out to values even larger than what 8 bits could contain, you still want some way of being able to compress them. Uh, and so we convert each value to a symbol offset pair. It's similar, think about the way that length or distance symbols are encoded with deflate. We have one symbol that is encoded with the Huffman code followed by an offset that's used just to put you numerically in the right range. Um, and so I won't go further into that, but basically that's what's done. We encode the delta values using pairs of symbols and offsets. Um, the offsets are encoded with a sort of two's complement-ish encoding. It's actually very bizarre. Uh, I, I, we, won't, we won't worry too much about it because you probably won't need that because it's so strange for your assignment. But it certainly seems as if they complicated things unnecessarily with that. So we take these symbol offset pairs of our differential encodings, we encode the symbol with a Huffman code, and the offset is written directly using a sort of two's complement E, like a, a, a signed representation that has some resemblance to two's complement. But that's lossless stuff, and we know a lot about lossless stuff by now, so we won't worry too much about that. We know there are lots of ways of encoding stuff into bits. Uh, as far as we're concerned, a lot of the insights from JPEG, like the zigzag ordering and the use of quantization matrices and scalar multiples, will be very useful on assignments three and four. But that's all I have to say about JPEG. And in the next lecture, the last lecture of the course, we're going to pick things up uh, and bring in one new dimension. We're going to keep working with images, but bring in a new dimension, the dimension of time, and begin talking about video compression, the subject of our biggest assignment, Assignment 4.